Ladies and gentlemen, it's Monday, November 28th, 2016. Here is a devastating report from John Brown. If you control the media, if you control the Justice Department, if you control the police, you own the system. Why does Pizzagate matter? Key elements include the ownership of Besta Pizza, located two doors down from Comet Ping Pong Pizza. Besta Pizza is owned by Andrew Klein, a lawyer with the DOJ's Human Trafficking Unit. This symbol, which has since been removed, is the exact symbol representing boy love that the FBI flagged in their investigation of public displays of pedophilia code. It's pretty simple. One of the leading prosecutors dealing exclusively with child trafficking decided to overtly display it on the menu of a business he owns. Coincidence? A case of bad luck regarding artistic license? Or is the red fox running the hen house? Another key element. Just three doors down from Besta Pizza is the politics and prose bookstore where many prominent politicians, including Barack Obama, have spoken. The bookstore is owned by Washington Post journalist Bradley Graham and his wife Lisa Muscatine. Muscatine served as chief speechwriter and top advisor to Hillary Clinton. Directly across the street from prose and poetry is the Beyond Borders office. Beyond Borders claims it is fighting to end child slavery in Haiti. This, after angry Haitians have demanded the billions of aid the Clinton Foundation stole from them. However, New Life Children's Refuge founder Laura Silsby, a woman with financial hellhounds on her trail due to her failing internet business personal shopper, which was rife with charges of unpaid employees, fraud, and wrongful termination suits, attempted to traffic 33 Haitian children into the Dominican Republic in the aftermath of the Haitian earthquake on January 12, 2010. Haitian officials placed Silsby and nine other missionaries under arrest for child trafficking. After all were released except for Silsby, Silsby's attorney withdrew as her counsel. Silsby then hired Jorge Pueyo, a Dominican attorney under investigation for child trafficking in El Salvador. It was then that Hillary and Bill Clinton stepped in to diminish the charges against Silsby. According to WikiLeaks, Hillary's interest in Silsby dated back nine years before the Haitian earthquake. WikiLeaks also reveals that Huma Abedin kept Hillary in the loop regarding Silsby's situation. Shania King, writing for the Harvard Human Rights Journal, elaborates, the Haitian justice system prodded in part by President Clinton's diplomatic efforts on behalf of the missionaries, determined that none of the missionaries were guilty of illegal activities except the leader, Laura Silsby, who faced a lesser charge of organizing illegal travel. Along with the Haitian justice system, some observers excused the missionaries' actions, even though they rose to the level of child trafficking. They did so essentially because we place such little value on the integrity of poor families. Another disturbing Pizzagate element James Alafontis has also visited the White House five times, which adds to the perverse nature of this WikiLeaks email regarding President Obama when the pedo code is applied to hot dog slash pizza. It reads, I think Obama spent $65,000 of the taxpayers' money flying in pizza slash dogs from Chicago for a private party at the White House not long ago. Assume we are using the same channels? I still go back to the same thing I've said from the beginning. A poor pedophile must go out and take the risk of being caught by grabbing their own victim. Does the rich pedophile take that risk of being caught? Heavens no. They pay someone. That's when we develop supply and demand that now has the name of human trafficking and it's going on everywhere in the United States. Say what you want about the filth on Comet Ping Pong pizza owner James Alafontis' Instagram. The most damaging pictures are those of digging holes in the floor in what appears to be an attempt to connect Comet Ping Pong to the exclusive underground labyrinth of Washington, D.C. Tie all of that into Alafontis' ranking as GQ's 49th most powerful man in D.C. and politics and prose owners Graham and Muscatine as numbers 50, Alephantis and company and the circumstantial evidence far outweighs even the Michael Jackson pedo scandal. Maybe that's why Macaulay Culkin named his band Pizza Underground. John Bound for Infowars.com Where there's smoke, there's fire. It's all in the WikiLeaks. It's all there. 
It is Monday, the 28th day of November 2016. We're going to be live here for the next four hours. And wow, is there a lot to cover. Every time I sit down, I just cannot believe how over the top it all is. I was going over just mainline news sites, the Associated Press, Reuters, you name it, McClatchy. I was going to Drudge. I was going to InfoWars. I was going to Breitbart. I was going to my email. I was going to Twitter. I was going to Facebook last night and this morning, just looking at things. And by the time I get on air, my head is spinning, just like I know yours is. There is a stack of news of Muslims doing horrible, horrible things to women and children and homosexuals. And the liberals don't care. They actually praise it and push it and promote it and are mad that I just used the word homosexual. All they care about is controlling the culture. And they like Islam. They like Orthodox Islam because it will meld into their authoritarianism quite nicely. It's crazy how bankrupt the, the so-called left is. It really is crazy. Look at these headlines. Indonesian woman flogged for close proximity with a man. She got cl closer than a foot away. Indonesian Muslim hardliners break up what they think is a gay sex party. Men aren't even allowed to have a party. After the beating, Moroccan TV, this is on mainline TV, airs makeup tips for hiding domestic violence. This is without me even looking for this stuff. Italy's Minister of Interior, surrender your homes to migrants or face jail. We saw a video of this last week. They're expanding it across the country, saying it may just be permanent. In fact, in Germany, they're saying, get out of your house. And of course, the migrants are almost all Muslim. Throwing people out and, and, and bringing, you know, 15 people into a tiny hotel with an 80-year-old guy named Luigi basically having a heart attack. Can't make that up. And then I've got Kaepernick, who is such a spoiled brat. Can we pull up my tweet about him today? I didn't put his name in it, but I, I tweeted this morning. I was doing a lot of tweeting this morning. I was so upset about just the state of the world. And I basically said, makes 100 plus million dollars plus. I, I looked it up. In his career, he's been paid about $180 million. If you count the 130 or so, he's been paid from the football league. And then there's a whole bunch more from sponsorship. Yeah, lives in the U.S., makes $100 plus million, talks crap 24-7 about America, and loves dead communist mass killer Castro. That's at Real Alex Jones. And do you know what the first tweet response was and a bunch of others were? Well, I bet Castro never called him the N-word. See, oh, he has white parents that adopted him. And then he goes around bitching everywhere. And it's all incongruent and stupid. And it's so cost celeb like Fidel Castro. I'll let folks know a little something. I mean, I think I've shown the letter on air. I don't think I'm breaking this here. But I was invited to go speak and have dinner with Ahmed Dinaji. Didn't do it. And I was invited to Cuba and told, and you might get to meet Castro. And then you go through a little thing and he pats you on the head like I'm a monkey. Didn't, didn't go on the Cuba trip 10 years ago. Back when I was exposed to the government for 9-11, they thought I was like a communist or something. No, I was a patriot just covering the facts. Just the facts, ma'am. Don't want to go to Iran. Don't want to have dinner. They're like, you don't understand. It was an official state letter of them calling me like 100 plus times. He wants to personally have dinner. The president wants to have dinner with you alone. Not just this big event. And I said, no. Everything paid first class. No. But let me tell you, Fidel Castro calls you or he pats you on the head like he's done so many people. And then, oh, he's so nice. People ask Albert Speer, the German interior minister, pretty much ran the Third Reich, why he was the only guy that got off at Nuremberg without you know a long prison sentence or death. And they said, why did you go along with Hitler? And he said, well, when the devil's got his arm around you in a warm embrace, you don't realize it's the devil. Now, now before we go any further, I, I, I want to just mention the other news that's here. But imagine the ignorance of the guy that r responded to my tweet, if we can put it back on screen, that, oh, I bet Fidel never called him the N-word. You don't know anything about Cuba or anything about the Caribbean, or anything about Latin America, if you knew anything about it, you would know that blacks, except for maybe Brazil, 
are treated much worse than they're treated anywhere in North America. I mean, it is unbelievably racist. But I just love the ignorant morons that tweeted me, bet Fidel never called him an N-word. Oh, the poor baby. I bet he might have been called the N-word. I was called a cracker-ass honky hundreds of times growing up in Dallas. Routinely walking down the street, black racers drive by. I ought to beat your ass, skinny ass crackerhead. You look like a cop, you blonde-haired freak. You blonde-haired devil. You blue-eyed devil. I ought to get out of this car and I ought to kill your ass. And I was brought up so colorblind that I'd go, I'm going to go over to my friend's house. I play football with this black. So I'd go over to the black neighborhood and they'd be like, you better come on back in my house with my grandma. That guy's racist, me, old black guy there with a shotgun. I'll kill your crack ass, blow your head off, boy. I mean, like, oh, that's racist, imitating. No, that's how people talk to me. It's okay to make fun of a, you know, Donald Trump's wife's accent. I can make fun of anybody's accent. We have to break with the political correctness and not be politically correct anymore. I have been in, let's just say, a lot of what I called fights. was where I was assaulted racially. But see, I transcend that and was never a tribalist because I understand those were brainwashed, ignorant people, just like there's white people that can act like that. But there is an open season to demonize white people. So let's say I want to call Kaepernick names. Is it okay if I said, well, I got called a cracker, and then I got hit in the head with a lead pipe. And then I was in the hospital for three days and could hardly see because the because the, the the concussion was so bad and then I got body slammed and got 15 stitches in the back of my head and then I fought back as I got older and put people in the hospital so I got thrown in juvenile repeatedly and they tried to break my parents parental control over me because they know how somebody 160 pounds was putting 250 pound people in the hospital and I mean in the hospital I'm not even proud of that, but I defended myself. I mean, I love, oh my God, I love that ignorant, racist, swollen, elitist on his own world, Bernie Sanders, going, if you are white, <laughs> if you are white, you don't know what it's like to be poor. Funny, I have the demographics here. The most wealthy, upwardly mobile group per capita is the first nine designations, you can look it up yourself, of Asians starting with Indians, and then it's Japanese, and then it just moves on down the line, and then it's other subgroups of what you would call Asian or mixed with Anglo. They call That's called Arab, with a sprinkling of African. People don't even know what an Arab is. But, oh, someone could tweet back at me that Fidel never called him an N-word. No, they just called Obama a Mayata and a black boy in the front page of Havana Papers because in a communist world, having someone grovel to Fidel and Raul and then getting to call him basically the N-word was a delicious pleasure. To have the American president called an N-word in front of everyone in their newspapers was a big joke pissing down our backs. But you don't care. You're a pseudo-intellectual that doesn't even know what a Mayata is. It means blackbird. You know, heckle and jekyll? It's a racist term. You've been in Latin America? You watch the cartoons on TV? You think you're at a freaking KKK rally? And I'm not even bashing Latin America. The point is, that's just how people are all over the world. You go to Saudi Arabia, you're not a Saudi Arabian, they're going to ask you every five feet what you're doing. You're a woman, you show your face, you're going to go to prison. The whole world's barbarous and backwards, and we look at America and then little Kaepernick bitches about his $170, $180 million he's made the last seven years. Oh, what a poor baby. And he's set to be paid millions and millions and millions more. And so he can run around and bitch. And he, he's got his right. People say, well, you know, Kaepernick, he's got his right. Why are you censoring him? I'm not censoring him. When I say the guy's a buffoon. I bet this guy never had a white person lay their finger on him unless it was his adopted mama spanking his butt or something. What a bunch of babies. What a bunch of babies. Sick of it. Tired of it. Makes me want to throw up. I told you last night, just to keep pointing out, before anybody announced this morning that Mitt Romney's going Tuesday to meet with... Mr. 45, there at Trump Tower, El Presidente-elect, 
And I also told you that uh, Petraeus was going to be going Tuesday. Told you last night on air. Told you the special video I did last night. And I'm just, just pointing out that uh, that just rubs it into the media. that They have no idea what's going on, and I do. And I, I just heard from multiple sources because of Conway and others standing up and Bannon standing up that uh, Trump is really backing away from Romney right now. The decision's not been made. Nobody knows but Trump. But the good news is I'm told that things are moving very nicely in that direction, so keep the heat on them. And Trump had really tried to work it out with Hillary and tried to say, look, I don't know what other prosecutors will do and stuff, but, you know, I'll try to back off here if you just, you know, you back off. And I told Trump a few weeks ago, I said, she's never going to back off. We, we did talk about some of this. I said, just watch. And now Trump sees that. She's not backing off with the whole recount. She's officially joined. So all that's going on. But, but before I get into all that today, I want to get into the key to everything, the absolute heart of what's destroying us straight ahead. We'll be back. I'm Alex Jones, InfoWars.com. Now, before I get to the heart of the matter, right here on the Alex Jones Show, thank you for joining us. I'm yours truly, Alex Jones. I want to just point out that hours ago, Drudge had it right, mass shooting Ohio State machete attack. He had to dig into a Daily Mail article to find a school official saying it was a machete because they were attacked. And it turns out, hours ago, the media knew this, but as of break time, is still announcing mass shooting. CNN in the break room was saying mass shooting will let you know more how many injured, how many dead. Well, turns out he had this written over an hour ago. Kit Daniels, Ohio State attack copies ISIS killing style. They've ordered ISIS and Islamists to launch more knife attacks and machete attacks. It's happening on a daily basis in the Western world, or even more often in some cases. Update, a federal law enforcement official said the suspect used a knife and a car in the attack. Just like the truck attack, remember in Nice, it wasn't an Islamic attack, it was a truck attack. Not a firearm, which still mimics the killing style of recent ISIS-inspired terror attacks. You can bet your bottom dollar that will get swept under the rug as quickly as possible. I haven't even hit the news yet. It's big. It's important. It's deep. That's coming up in the next long segment. But I was complaining this morning in there with some of my managers that when I leave my children for a couple days with loving, good family that I care about, when they come back, they're like zombies. And it's not that they're eating bad food. They're watching lots of television. Uh, they're not focusing as much. They're stumbling around. Uh, it's a joke. And I actually have hundreds of studies. Anybody can Google uh, television watching linked to Alzheimer's, neurological disorders, lower IQ, uh, Asperger's disorder. When you're a kid, if you watch too much TV, uh, you can just Google doctors say don't let kids have any screen time. Uh, Steve Jobs wouldn't let his uh, kids have any screen time. And if you let them have any of it, they then just start demanding it all the time. It's, it's, it's amazing. I'm the type on a plane ride or maybe the fifth hour of a trip in a car, I'll say, all right, here, here it is. But I shouldn't even do that. With my first child, we didn't let him have any TV till about two and a half. The others, we caved in quicker. But depression, loneliness, it's all linked to it. Everybody knows this. And so I am officially just taking the TVs completely out, except for one that's going to be in a closet on a roller that you've got to bring out to watch DVDs or films. That's it, maybe once a week. I'm done. And if you want to know the secret to defeating the globalist, it's stop watching mainline television. The flicker rates, all of it puts you into a dreamlike state. Sure, you're watching stuff online. This lowers IQs to certain points. Studies show, but not as bad as mainline TV or entertainment TV where you suspend disbelief. This is fact-oriented that we're showing exhibits. We're making you access information in your own brain. Stuff that's just filler lowers IQ because it doesn't cause neurons to expand out. Reading does because you have to image everything you read. If you say a Titanic hit the iceberg in the North Atlantic, listed for two hours, then sunk to the bottom. You picture all you know about the Titanic. You have to draw it up in your mind. It expands neurons. It expands connections. When you listen to talk radio, it's been found to boost IQ even more than reading because you're audibly listening to it. And most people get their truest form of learning like sitting around the campfire. They've got studies where if you have a campfire, people are more attentive and listen. That's why Hitler would have his rallies with big, huge fires at night. This is all known, okay? Now, that said, Weldon Henson was in there, and he goes, absolutely, you know, our, our, our daughter, who's the sweetest thing around, uh, wasn't allowed to have any TV for two years, wild girl, which she's supposed to be, bouncing off the wall, she's so smart, and Weldon told me the shocking development when they let her watch TV as a test, Weldon Henson. Well, I guess, you know, we had that long weekend, everybody was off for a few days, and 
So day four, I think me and my wife were going crazy because the kid is just running around, which is great. We're happy that what they're supposed wild. to. Yeah. So day four, we're just like yesterday. We're like, all right, that's it. We've had enough. Turn. Let's just turn the TV on. We only have one TV. We don't have cable. We just try to find some stuff on the antenna. I walk in the room to do something. I come back out in two minutes, Alex. I walk out and my daughter looks like she is in a trance. She's like sloped down on the couch, like taking the the prone position or whatever, whatever you would do. To, just, just totally unconscious in a dream state. I, it actually scared me, to be honest with you. I was like, oh, my gosh. I was like, hey, Brielle, what, what, you know, hey. And then my wife came out. She's like, what's the matter? I said, Brielle looks like she's in a trance. She looks like she's she's all of a sudden. Because she's in a medical trance. And it was the first time we'd let her watch TV. She's just a little over two years old. Magicians a thousand years ago swinging a jewel with a candle could uh, put you into a trance. Imagine Listen, the entire UT psychology department, Weldon, I was led into it secretly 15 years ago. I can talk about it now because the guy moved on to MIT, and I'm just going to stop right there. I ran into one of the other guys when I had surgery. He was the anesthesiologist, strangely enough. That's what they were running in there on these monkeys. The point is, is that they had them all wired in to their brains, and that just and it was the monkey farm in Bastrop. I was, I was allowed to see it, and it looked like something out of a science fiction movie. Hundreds of monkeys, apes, hooked into deals. And they're just hitting them with flicker rates for the Defense Department just studying how to put people into a trance welding. That's what the carrier waves they've got on MSM are. I've always believed that TV was just like a, a weapon the New World Order uses for sure. Uh, man, you know, it freaked me out to see her like that. You know, she's a little over two years old. She's always been crazy and energetic and just very vocal. And I, I, I told my wife, I said, let's turn the TV off. You know, I know we've gone to the park twice already today. I said, we're going again. We have a little park, you know, block away from our exactly. house. Exactly. How long did it take? Let's talk about how long till she got out of the trance, because here's the deal. I'm going to explain all this when we come back. This, this, is, this is the big enchilada, folks. Stay with us. So I just sat here in the last little six-minute segment and rattled off to you personal experiences, being given a very quick look into a secret DARPA mind control operation that's not even heavily guarded. It was low-level secret, restricted, not even classically secret. I sit here and I read you Associated Press, Reuters, BBC, admitting IQ lowering, brain damage, uh, neurological disorders from television, general public, uh, you know, disassociative uh, disorders, uh, not able to connect with other people. The language is shrinking. And you know how uh, Matt Taibbi and people at the Rolling Stone respond. They go... That's Alex Jones claiming there's a zombie apocalypse and gay frogs. That's that's their talking point. These are big journalists. They just have 10 or 15 points that are given by the Southern Poverty Law Center and the White House that are approved. This has all come out in the WikiLeaks. And then they just repeat them like they're geniuses and then go to coffee shops and talk about how liberal they are. When we're the real liberals. Julian Assange is a real liberal. Snowden is a real liberal by exposing evil. But the point I'm getting at here is... I only say that because Taibbi, I mean, I'm attacked by all these people every day, almost every hour. I mean, there's everything from the Australian papers to the German papers to the New Zealand papers to the UK papers to the US papers. I can't even read it all. I mean, we're talking, let's not exaggerate, 100 articles a day. With, I mean, because I get the Google alerts. It actually sends them. It's just like, what the hell? And it's like all, you'll see for like a week, the same article rewritten by everybody. That's how you know it's directed. And you'll see another article rewritten by everybody. And you're like, this is so centralized. And then it was just everywhere. He says Obama sent a tornado five years ago to Oklahoma City. He says frogs are gay. And everybody laughs. When I was on Howard Stern and brought this up and he laughed and said, oh, gay frogs and gay shrimp. And I said, yeah, yeah, gay frogs and gay shrimp. When I was doing a whole diatribe warning people and reading new scientists about how the frogs are either asexual or deformed. What? And then it turns into a gay frog joke. This is happening. We're, our sperm counts are down 90%. We're dying. Our kids are, br are brain damaged. The average person can hardly talk now. The, the IQs are dropping. Everything's happening. And all they do is make little jokes to each other like it's funny. This is like Omega Man. We're trying to save these people, and they're out to get us. Uh, you were talking about your daughter, though. You were saying we got to take her to the park again. Hey, get her with paints. Get her a train set. Get her an erector set. They're meant to just be building things, and that's the dynamic human spirit. And I'm telling you, you don't give kids vaccines. You keep them away from television. They're bouncing off the walls. They look healthy. They excel. My kids, and I don't want to brag, they win all the speech awards all because the, they're in school, all the school awards. It's like all of them. Just oh, every time, number one. Every time, you know, uh, class president. Every time, 
And, and they're not even trying to because they're not zombos. Go ahead. <clears throat> well, our daughter's super healthy. I mean, and she is wild. I mean, we have folks come over and, and visit, and they're just like, wow. That's entertainment. Your, your child is full of energy. And, uh, and you know, don't get me wrong. There's been My nickname when I was a kid was Wild Man. Hey, you know, I like it. Me and my wife talk about it all the time. We're like, well, this is way better. And this is what I've always felt like. That's how they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be full of energy. They're supposed to be wild. Uh, you know, but the thing we're gonna we're not gonna do is is stick them in front of a TV just so we can have time to ourselves. Like that's not very fair. And, and and I guess we. Well, now it's not your kid. Now it's the states. And folks, let me be honest with you. As the years have gone by, I have used a television uh, as a pacifier, and, and and you lie to yourself and go, "Oh, I'm gonna let them watch a Nova show, or I'm gonna let them watch." But then sooner or later, oh, they're you catch them watching the Kardashians. It's just got to be cut off. I mean, the list of unhealthy reasons, especially under the age of six, zero. Well, there's the scary thing is, is if, if you read, I was just reading actually a, a, an article and they were like, kids under five, the average amount of TV time they watch a day is two to three hours, Alex. Do you know what that's doing to them? By the way, the parents that's lie lot. in those studies. It's estimated it's actually eight hours. And that's scary. I mean, our daughter. They've watched, done studies on the studies. The parents are lying. Our daughter was watching TV for 15 minutes yesterday, and that was the first time she ever watched it. She was in a trance. And for a second there, I kind of felt like what it must be like whenever you over-vaccinate your kid and you come home and they're not quite normal. And I, that's the kind of eye-awakening uh, Absolutely. Know, thing Absolutely. Well, expanding on that, Weldon, you're an artist that's playing four or five nights a week to sometimes crowds of 10,000 people at the rodeo and the Houston Rodeo, you name it. Your, your music's on XM. You know, you're, you're, you're a successful guy right there at that tier under superstar. You've been doing it since you got out of the Air Force 10 years ago, been working with us. But you've run up the ladder here to you know run our shipping and uh, also uh, part of our promotions department. You do a better job than folks I hired that had, you know, uh, Harvard degrees, literally. Boy, were they a nightmare. Uh, you learn real quick, those people are big problems. And but, but still, you're working hard. You're doing things. You got your own life. You're barbecuing with friends over. I come over. Uh, you know, you're going out fishing. Uh, we're, you know, we're going out bowling. We're, you know, or maybe we go out and see a movie. But it's like once a week or every two weeks. It's not our God where we sit around with our dinners. Times I go to your house for dinner, we sit around your damn your I, kitchen I table sure and I, we talk. You know, a lot we of arm people, wrestle. A lot of people spend thousands of dollars on TVs. You know what I did, Alex? We don't watch TV in our house. I spent a couple thousand dollars on a big, nice dinner table. That's right. <laughs> no, I'm I'm not joking. No, that's why I sit there and eat T-bone steaks. You know, when I moved to Austin, and you go to a, you go to a local butcher and get your meat. It's all yeah. about a lifestyle, folks. It is. It Disconnecting is. from the corporates. We don't. And, and then folks say, "Well, how are you able to do all this, Weldon? I mean, you, you're you're helping run Infowars. You you have a music career going. You it's, it's crazy." I said, "You know what I did ten years ago when I moved here to do this? I swore off TV. I don't watch TV. You know how many times whenever I was in the Air Force, which we were still having fun, you'd come home after work and you and you would turn on the TV and you're like, "Hey, I'm going to watch this show for thirty minutes. Next thing you know, it's it's midnight." Yeah. Yeah. And so when I moved on. Yeah, you weren't out the no pool hall TV. picking up a chick. You weren't out playing basketball. You weren't out golfing. You were sitting there giving this thing your entire life. People say, well, you're a hypocrite, Alex. You're on TV. We came here to overthrow the mainline corporate system. We came here like the Matrix. They jack into the Matrix to get to you, but we're not of the Matrix, folks. We're here jacking into this thing, warning you, and I'll say it again. Statistically, this is not as good. And, we, and our main audience is talk radio. Let's not forget that talk radio is very good for your brain. Look at all this. Just Google talk radio. Listening, listening to book on tape is good for your brain. You'll get more articles on that, but it's the same thing. Spoken word is good for the brain. You add a fire to it. It takes you to a place. Let me tell you where I am. I hate it when it gets hot because you know where I am. I'm in my backyard around a fire pit and three hours goes by and I got my kids hugging me and we cook little, little steaks over it. And, and have a salad out and there. And you talk and you discuss things. And it's just, I'm hired to damn kite. No, that's exactly what we do. Fire is the original television set, folks. I'm telling you, I want to launch an entire program of eradicating televisions and going to people's houses and just clapping while they destroy their televisions. I'm telling you, I want to start a jihad on televisions, Weldon. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, we don't even have cable or anything. And smartphones, too. I mean, I use them myself so effectively that I explain, this is evil, but I have one, but it's so hypocritical. How do I handle that? I mean, I really only use this to fight the New World Order. I don't sit there and screw around on it. But 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 then my kids are like, we can't have phones, but you've got one. What do I do? Uh, I think you just really explain to them that you're using it as a weapon. It's a tool. It's a dangerous weapon, too. Yeah, absolutely. Tracks everywhere I go, everything I do. I remember 20 years ago, there'd be reporters coming. Or, I wasn't even that away. 20, 18 years ago, and I'd turn a cell phone off and put it away before I talked about something classified I've been told or whatever. 
And they'd say, that's crazy. And I said, I've been told by NSA people that they've got tracker chips in it and they triangulate and they listen and, and they've got keywords that activate it and start recording once they hear it. And they're just, you're crazy. Why do you cover up, you know, your, your, you know or unplug your camera when, you know, when you go to bed at night? Well, I don't want to have them videotape me having sex with my wife. All come out. That's what they do, folks. Yeah, I mean, the cell phone's another thing. You know, I know me and my wife, you know, we, we come into the house and we set our phones down on the kitchen table right there and they don't go anywhere else with us in the house. I like the fact I was trying to get a hold of David Knight for about a day uh, during Thanksgiving. You know what? He had his phone shut off and he wasn't answering it. I just was like, you know what? I'm shutting mine off. Well, that's a huge distraction as well. We've got to, we've got to, it's not selfish. We've got to take back our lives. Like Drudge said, when he said, feel the, you know, air, you know, touch the water. I forget the exact quote. It was better than what I just said. When we saw that evil photo of Zuckerberg walking and he's bipedal, everybody else is devolved, squatting there with these cheap AI systems on their head. That these people are trying to control us. Google Glass has failed. All of, we don't want this crap. And notice now that they tell us all the CEOs go, this is a false reality. We offer a better one now. This is all fake. We're going to make it as ugly as we can. That's been declassified. So you accept this drugged, fake AI system. No, I don't want to accept a world in a universe you make. Can, can we pull up the Drudge tweet about uh, Zuckerberg and the AI? Forget it. Like, Drudge tweet says, you know, you know, remember the, you know, the wind in your hair, touching the water, or something like that. I need to send out stuff. Stuff. More, more. I saw this thing on 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 Reddit this morning because I'll go there a lot on the Donald because they have great news hounds. They find a lot of links and things, and I and I saw it, and it was like. Reddit had put out the question, what is globalism? Like talking to us like, what is the color yellow and what does it mean to you like you're three years old? That's how they, they get off on talking to us because and, 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 you, know, you think on the surface, oh, they're dumb or they think we're dumb. No, no, no. They know dumbing down the message, the message is the medium. The message is turning you into that. They talk to you like that to dumb the language down. What is globalism? Does it exist? It's like saying, what is the sun? Does it exist? Well, it's funny, Alex, we just got out of this huge, you know, um, presidential, you know, electoral, you know, whole deal. And I could always tell my friends who watch TV and they watch enormous amounts of, of TV just because when you'd have a conversation with them about, you know, the presidential uh, debates or whatever, you could tell. Who, they regurgitate. Who, yeah, you could tell who watches lots of TV and who doesn't and who actually goes out and seeks information, tries to find the truth. And people just have talking points that, you know. They just spell. Well, notice MSNBC and CNN and, and, and people like Matt Taibbi, they'll talk about how they're intellectual all day. What they are is really emotional cult members of their church of control. And they can't admit that they're in a limited lexicon, they're in a limited thesaurus, a limited paradigm. We're totally off the reservation. Labels mean nothing here. I don't care what color you are, where you're from, as long as you promote freedom and, and, and believe in humanity, I love you. You're my brother, you're my sister. But I will not sit here then through guilt and bow down to your system that's only meant to make me submit. You're not trying to get me to say I'm sorry for stuff I didn't do to make the world better. You're doing it to make me your slave because you know I'm virtuous and I'm not going to do it. But looking at this, think about how controlled the media is. Think about everything we've talked about has come true. <clears throat> think about how the world is getting crazier and crazier and it's, it, it's state run. And, and communism as an operating system of the robber barons is being rolled out on a planetary scale, Weldon, and their biggest weapon is the television. You look at the Mark Dice interviews, where 9 out of 10 people say put gun owners in forced labor camps. Uh, 9 out of 10 say, you know, I, mean, I, I mean, the latest thing is, you know, uh, put Bigfoot on the endangered species list. He's not going out and finding mentally retarded people or folks that are deaf. These are normal people off the street. This is California. This is trendy Austin. Where, let me tell you something. They don't know what freaking planet they're on. They're, they're in a trance, and it's actually funny to them. That's the thing that really dis disturbs me sometimes. It, they actually find that it's, it's funny that they don't know about anything. Exactly. Their pleasure is that, is that they're uninformed, and they'll always have some bigoted statement like, you speak with a Texas accent, I don't listen to that. And they relish being uninformed. They relish uh, being sheep. They, they, uh, they relish being led around. And then, I, and then I look at their so-called guides. I have met with and been around a lot of the top journalists in the country. And you have dinner with them. They're stupid. I've been at the highest levels of Hollywood. And, you know, they're stupid. I, I, I mean, what's crazy is to sit back and realize, oh, my God, common sense is 100 times smarter than these people that live in this <laughs> whole plastic system and have no idea what they're well, even part of. It's too much work for them to actually go listen to 15 minutes of your show Instead, they just like to discredit you and say, well, he thinks frogs are gay. 
ha, 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 it's a big joke, it's funny. Discredit him, right? Does and then I him? come back out with sometimes 100 articles. I've done this like five times, just testing them. And I'll go, here's the new scientist. Here's this sign of a report. Here's the Associated Press. Here's Reuters. Here's this university. Let me have a scientist on. It's, 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 it's an epidemic of sperm low counts and, and, and tumors caused by glyphosate. And I'll go, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so sick of him saying that I'm saying it's gay frogs. This is made up. Hillary took that clip of me saying I'm sick of them saying gay frogs and put it in her national TV ad saying I said gay frogs again. And again, it's that they're, they think you're so stupid they would sit there and do that to you. They would sit there and they put out new uh, Trump clips, supposedly from his wife, uh, saying that she had to use mace on him. They're the ones launching this giant fake news crescendo. They know they can just lie and put out one-liners that draw attention and that are lies, and they know people will buy and it. And then they, exactly, but then then they're accusing us of it. And, and I mentioned Matt Taibbi, just, I, I just picked him out because, you know, it's just people just walk around going, oh, oh. I'm liberal. I'm Rolling Stone. Oh, I'm sorry. We're only something like 50-something times bigger, according to Quantcast, than, than the Rolling Stone. People wonder why the Rolling Stone calls the New York Times. I don't even call them back because they're a joke. They're just wanting to interview us to act like they, they did a real interview. We're way bigger than them. We're done with them. So continuing, at least he's out saying labeling news as fake is very dangerous and is a blacklist and we shouldn't do it. So I singled him out for attacking me a bunch the last few days. And then I actually see him, though, at least agreeing, you know, this attempt to attack, but, but then the international or, or you know, a bunch of organizations of journalists have come out and said, this is really dangerous. And plus, the new list the Washington Post is using, Weldon, didn't even, it doesn't even say who it is. It's some nebulous website and lists Drudge and ourselves and says we're completely fake. And then Google puts alerts up on Google Chrome now saying, don't go to our sites, we're dangerous. I mean, folks, that is such a, a, a chevron, such a star, a gold star, a medal. I think you want that. I mean, they're, uh, they're, oh, they're no, exactly. They're like designating that we're the bad guys. All I just did was show you a bunch of medical studies that TV's brain damaging your kids. Everybody knows that. They're exposing what is themselves. fake about that? What, what they don't like, folks, is the sincerity. They don't like sincerity is, is where the power is, folks. That's when you get fully connected in your body with your gut, your brain, and, and your spirit is when you're for real and really care. You're not alive. You don't even, you're, you don't even activate your spirit. I don't read this in some book or one of these phony churches. I know it. You don't activate yourself till you really care and until you really stop living in fear of what people think about you. And, and I'm just telling you, folks, you can do it anytime you want. You just say, God, come into me. Show me the truth. I want to defeat evil. And it's just like God will say, are you ready for this? And then the doors go, boom, blow back. And you're like, whoa. I'm just telling people, you can leave the matrix right now, folks. But let me tell you, you start down the rabbit hole, all I'm offering is the truth. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Ten years ago, whenever I moved to Austin, started working for you, Alex, uh, it definitely is a way to open your eyes, and you see things different. And you read, and you and you look into things, and you're trying to find the truth. And and, and then you, all of a sudden, it, it actually becomes a little addicting. Then all of a sudden, you're you're looking for, for more of that. You're looking for sincerity in everything you do. And then actually, like you said, it's, it's, it's down the rabbit hole you go. And, and, then and you once you've had lifestyle. sincerity and real love, not fake, um, you know, moral signaling, once you've got the real thing, it's like a woman you really love, you, suddenly you don't want any of the other women. It's fun. The, when I started when I started cutting TV out, all of a sudden it's like, I don't even want to see a TV at all. I don't even want to see, I don't care if it's not on, I don't even want to be around it. You know, I want to be out camping. Oh, that's like, people don't believe me that, like, this new Mel Gibson movie, I know they licensed some clips of me in there, and I'm in there, and I'm in this other movie, and a bunch of, I mean, I mean you name it, and I, and I license them just because I'll, I'll see what they do. I just, you know, sign the agreement. Christian Bale movie, you name it. The point is, it's such a pleasure that I hosted, like, four shows on History and Discovery a few years ago, and I never watched one of them. <laughs> I mean, let me tell you, let me tell you something. Most of these people, they they're on the show, they're sitting down with their family. You know, you know, it's like the X-Files characters based on me or whatever. But that's just a sign of success, breaking the matrix. It's like, I don't get a power trip out of it, but I do take enjoyment, Weldon, in the fact that I don't watch any of it. Now, I did watch two of the X-Files. I, I, and I did watch those. Well, you already like, moved on. You're, you're learning more things. You're, you're, just, you're discovering more I'm things. in the real world. Not, exactly. Well, you're awesome, brother. I'm going to come back at the big news straight ahead. Spread the word, folks. We're part of the awakening. You're part of the awakening. I love you. By the way, I never go off on Jags like that in the last 18-minute segment for no reason. It's important sometimes to just ignore all the incredible news because... 
We could talk about Kaepernick and all his garbage. I mean, this is just some idiot that watches TV all day and, you know, sees Google and Facebook funding all this race war crap. This is just some waffle head that thinks if he bitches and gets into political correctness that, you know, it's somehow he's trendy and cool and doing something avant-garde when the guy's a joke. Bucking the system, defeating the system, overthrowing the system, empowering individuals is the answer. We have a scientific, global dictatorship that is third-wave colonialism establishing corporate world governance. I talked about Reddit today. was like, what is globalism? Is it like globalization? And everybody starts going, are you kidding? It's the announced form of planetary government in thousands of publications. They're like, oh, we heard the alt-rights into it. Does it exist? Of course they know they're globalist. It's all part of their game. The best hacks, like I want a slow Loris attack, is where they just hit you with a handshake to your computer but never even ask for a command. It's just the first point of connection. And then it's like, like, you know, like the punk kid would do in junior high. He'd reach out to shake your hand. They go, oh, I'm too cool to shake your hand. It was like an, uh, practicing how to be dishonorable. That's what they do. Now, I hate to say, see, I told you so. But I have not believed Trump would get in office without a major fight since he won two plus weeks ago. And I said that at the time. I said, okay, my spider sense says celebrate the victory over political correctness. Hillary's coming back. And I, I personally told Trump. I said, President-elect, she's going to still contest this. She's going to stage riots. They're going to try to get a recount. And justice has to be done. I understand the president doesn't go after people, but you know we need a strong attorney general, but I don't think you're going to get to that point. He said, just a moment, just a moment. He comes back 10 seconds. He goes, Very interesting, Alex. Tell me more. I got the feeling somebody else came on the line. I think he, <laughs> the word I got was he'd been having an argument with somebody five minutes before about that exact thing. <laughs> And I don't tell you these stories to impress you, ladies and gentlemen. I tell you these stories because not living in the matrix like the general public has brought me to this point. The real interfacing with reality is outside of the corporate system. Everything the corporate system does is to keep you controlled and programmable and not conscious and not awake and not your own person. So I'm going to break all this down. But of course, Hillary was behind the recount the entire time. The Democratic donors were behind it. And now Ritz Priebus came out and sounded the alarm that she's going to try to overturn it. And they're trying to overturn the electors. And they're going to try to steal it on December 19th and the 20th at the Electoral College. I told you that a week and a half ago before the frickin' recount started. Because of the death threats and stuff going on two electors, and also my sources, but I'll just be quite frank with you. 90% of what we do is right out of mainstream news. We just analyze it, but 10% is my gut, baby, and it's never wrong. Now, it doesn't mean Trump won't get in, but they're pulling out every stop. Now, I've done 58 minutes of broadcast here and haven't plugged one time. Other hosts plug every minute, every five minutes. I need your support. This is Cyber Monday. We're extending Black Friday specials even more. Nobody's taking advantage of free shipping with promo code FREE at checkout. Just add F-R-E-E. -E very low numbers of people purchasing stuff are adding free at checkout to get free shipping. That's fine if you want to support the podcast and not get the free shipping. Uh, but we've got 30 to 40% off InfoWars Select Storable Food today only. That special didn't run the last week. Uh, super high quality storable food, InfoWarsStore.com. Extended specials, colloidal silver, 50% off. Silver Bullet at InfoWarsLife.com. Super Mel Vitality, 30% off. And 30% off uh, on X2. And, 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 and there's other stuff. 50% off at InfoWarsStore.com or call 888-253-3139. We need your support. We need your prayers. We are battle-hardened. We are committed. We are the spirit of 1776. No one can deny it. But frankly, I'm completely possessed by it. Listen, it's not that what I'm saying is that special. It's that the globalists are projecting a system that is meant to hurt you. <laughs> All I'm trying to do is promote free will and a chance for children to grow up and be their own persons and differentiate and really create magical directions for humanity to go in. I realize children are magic. It's why I want to protect them. I want to build a better world for them. And my instinct is I want to kill people that want to hurt them. I'm going to be honest with you.
That's why I can't c cover Pizzagate that much is because it, uh, I, I can't have a heart attack, people. So and I don't say this like I'm some great goody two-shoes, but I have a lot of empathy. And, you know, that's associated with more of an awareness, more of a connection to the world. But I'm also a pragmatist. You know, there are people that have so much empathy that uh, I showed a picture of me over at a friend's house cutting up their turkey. And did you know that animal was probably kept in torturous conditions and wanted a good life and it was killed? Here's the deal. It's a prey animal. It's an animal that humans and coyotes and wolves and wildcats eat. And so that's its place in the universe. Should it be treated humanely? Absolutely, because I deserve to eat something that's non-GMO and not full of garbage. And if I do, I'm punishing myself. Karma, or you reap what you sow, is certainly real. But the agenda pushing animal rights, the agenda pushing animal rights is anti-human and meant to take control over the environment from us so we can't be independent. That's why the Department of the Interior and Department of Labor, remember five years ago, wanted to ban kids doing any chores on the farm because they want you in there watching TV, being a good little processed bot into the new system. Now, once the processing's done, they admit they're going to turn all this crap off and really set up a nightmare situation. You know, my, my dad's dad loved his cows so much, he'd, he'd come over and he'd pet them. And remember my dad, when I was a kid, joking, after his dad died, he said, yeah, this, this herd was never profitable. We're going to sell this thing off. My dad wouldn't be happy because he'd hardly sell cows. But he'd been a World War II bomber pilot and a tough guy and a Golden Gloves boxing champ and a smart guy. He was a tough guy, uh, you know, man's man. But he, he fed those cows and was around those cows. He only had a couple hundred of them that he wouldn't even kill them. He wouldn't even sell them off. Or if he would, he'd shoot them in the head himself haul them up with a tractor by their legs and butcher them himself. And it was it was a whole connection to the earth. And then the average trendy would say, well, that's barbarous to kill something yourself. No, it's a respect thing that if you're going to kill this cow, you're going to kill it yourself. We just totally lost touch with our humanity. I could sit here and tell you all day long about Kaepernick and what a little spoiled, rotten piece of filth he is. What is it? Where does that get us? Where does that get us ahead? And then I think about the ruling class. They're the only people that would be willing to do all these bad things to control and shutter humanity. And that's why they've been given the power on this planet to do what they do. is because they're Satanists. And those of us that don't want to grab a kid out of their backyard and torture them for six months and drug them before you blow their head off, that sounds like a damn nightmare. You'd, you'd kill yourself before you did any of that, wouldn't you? Before I'd fish some kid out of their backyard and throw them in a van and drug them and take them for frickin' scumbags or rape the hell out of them, before I even thought about doing that, I'd blow my head off. See, they call us weak because we don't have the strength of a Satanist. You people don't have strength. You're crippled. You're mentally ill. All you've got is that worship of evil power. But there is justice in the universe, and your evil has grown great. So know this. We'll get our hands around your throat soon enough. All right, we are back live. We are watching a disgusting parade of Kaepernick and Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, and Obama and others. Uh, in fact, Obama, they're saying, might go to the funeral of Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro killed hundreds of thousands of people. He launched wars in Angola that killed, some estimates are half a million people. No one really knows. Uh, I, I, I've even had family and friends that fought in southern and central Africa. It was just a decades of hell. Uh, a lot of it never even on our news. The communists just go into whole villages, kill everyone that don't submit. And then Fidel Castro lived in a palace with all these women. He was a CIA blowback program. That's all declassified. 
And I get the fact that, you know, the CIA tried to kill him, so he was a survivor, so he looks like a hero, but the CIA created him. And I just can't believe if Donald Trump did one-tenth of what Castro's done, I wouldn't support him. Doesn't matter if Donald Trump, you know, likes me and, you know, calls me and says thank you. I was invited to Cuba before, and they're like, you might meet with Castro, pat on the head. That's what he does with all these idiots who I see tweeting and saying how great he was. And it's just so frustrating to see this when... Look at Venezuela, look at Cuba, look at North Korea, look at what happened in Russia, look at China. Communism is just a bunch of ruling generals controlling the economies and demanding your daughter come service them. I mean, it is a horrible system of slavery, but it's pushed as the best thing since sliced bread. Now, we've got that going on, and we've got the point that Soros and Hillary have bankrolled $7 million to the head of the Green Party, which is really the Communist Party, to... Do recounts. And the big tell, as I said a week ago, is it's only in states Trump won. Only in battlegrounds. When there's other states Hillary clearly stole, according to Beth Harris, who's a real election fraud expert, a real liberal. She just tells the truth. But we saw it happen. 100% many key precincts where Hillary won, where she got 100% of the vote. Does anybody believe that? Does anybody believe any of this crap? So I, I've told Trump... I. When I talked to him a couple weeks ago, I've told his people, I said, you watch. They're not going to give up. They want those five Supreme Court justices. They want to launch these wars. They're not giving up. They know you're a nationalist. And you telling them you're not going to prosecute them, they're not stupid. You're not going to be able to find any prosecutor that won't want to go after them with the, with the stuff that's happened. Now, it came out as soon as Hillary launched this a few days ago that Trump is looking to have other foreign governments release the foundation info, the laundered money, just like we pressure Switzerland to expose somebody. So, quite frankly, I knew that over a week ago, and I was saying just trust Trump, because at the level we've gotten, this is beyond journalism now. We always tell the truth, but if something's going to damage the country or, 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 our, or our free system, if I've got something, I'm not going to tell people if it helps the enemy. We're in a total war, folks. This isn't rhetoric. We're in a total war. We are 53 days out from the inauguration of Donald Trump. He is completely surrounded. We have a precarious beachhead. I liken this to Normandy, and 20 troop carriers have landed. We've only got 300 troops on the shore, and, and it's all coming down. And they are planning something big, folks. Race riots, destabilization, you name it. They want a civil war. Let me tell you something. I'm not a drama queen. Everybody knows that. I've Liberals, I've never had problems with liberals. They are coming up and brandishing guns at me on the street. They are telling me they're going to get me. Uh, I've actually gone ahead and I'm going to pull the trigger and get full-time security now uh, because of it. It's serious, okay? And I'm not going to get into all the stuff that's happening, but let me just tell you something. It's bad, okay? And it shows the season we're in. We got communists up and down the street in Austin with guns threatening and say kill cops with guns in their hands. That's not free speech. That's a terroristic threat. So... We're here, 53 days out. I cannot stress to you how serious the situation is. Economist Stephen Moore said on Fox News that election results are overturned. We will be looking at a civil war. And he's absolutely right. And that's their plan because they can't win politically. And they know there's a great awakening, not of right wing stuff or racism, but of nationalism and common sense and freedom and not being bullied by political correctness and it's happening from Catalonia and Spain to what's happening in Brazil to what's happening with the Brexit, with the EU. The EU. And, and, and they have a question, you know, like, oh, on Reddit, what's globalism? It's worldwide corporate tyranny. And people are waking up to it. So their whole investment, everything they've done, the banksters have done, is coming unraveled. And it's got to the point where the Pope, who's officially making a deal with the Communist Chinese to set Catholic doctrine, that's Associated Press, The Guardian, Pope, possible deal with China would betray Christ, says Hong Kong Cardinal. It actually says, we will set our doctrine worldwide, not just in Beijing, with you. This is a takeover. They said it's one about the Catholic Church. It had its problems. It was taken over by pedophile rings, infiltrated. That's how they blackmail. It's how it controls. That's why good U.S. intelligence agencies or good groups in it leaked all the Pizzagate stuff as a checkmate instead of them using this against our government. They recruited pedophiles in the government. Let's just get the whole thing out. And that's why Assange has disappeared, because he was ready to release it all, folks. We are in the most dangerous time in world history right now. So I wanted to get, and I appreciate him coming on on short notice, former Navy SEAL, 
author, researcher, Matt Bracken, enemiesforeignanddomestic.com. Uh, you know, I noticed today we saw a jihad-style attack. We'll try to cover up who he is. But it was reported very early on in local news it was a machete and car attack, just like Nice, France. They were saying it was a gun, see? And, and notice they announced two years ago, quote, the legalization of fake news by the CIA through the State Department in Foreign Affairs and the CFR and in the Washington Post. We put that on screen. U.S. legalizes fake news. That's why they now announce we're fake news. Can, can we pull that up? Or I can do it. There, oh, there it is. U.S. ends ban on domestic propaganda. Yeah, but they'll say that's RT. I want to show the Washington Post. Just click web because it's an old article. Just, just click web. I want to show people the Washington Post and Foreign Affairs. U.S. ends ban on fake news. And notice now the dinosaur media comes out and says that we're the fake news. Ladies and gentlemen, we're the opposite. Here, I'll pull it up. We're the opposite of fake news. We're going to go to our guest. I'm going to pull this up right now because this is important. Everybody needs to see this. Okay? U.S. lifts ban on fake news. It's, it's, it's foreign affairs. It's Washington Post. I'm going to pull that up. U.S. lifts ban on fake news. All right, as long as it takes, I'm going to do this. Google and Facebook take aim at fake news. That's a new article from this month. No, I, I want to show hey, Alex, this is Nico. I'm live on the air. I just wanted to explain that uh, foreignpolicy.com, the site that we usually show the article, it's behind a paywall. So we're able to get it to load for a few seconds, but then it uh, jumps off screen. Oh, I got it. Well, I'm not mad. I, I understand. I'm just frustrated because because I want to, uh, people are going to say it's RT, so it's not real. I want to hit them with the Washington Post foreign affairs publication. You're awesome, Nico. There it is. Great job. U.S. repeals propaganda ban. Spreads government-made news to Americans. And by the way, I want to say about the whole crew, they're on the spot in there trying to search in live time everything I say to just show you, unlike anybody else, we do this. So you guys know I'm not mad at you, right? Good. Great crew. There it is. U.S. repeals. Print that for me or pay, pay the paywall. I don't care. Because it was my dad texted me earlier. He goes, Alex, the fake news is the fact that they started this three years ago. So again, this is the declared war against free speech that's now happening. You understand? So I cannot stress to you the emotional level here, but I'm very intellectual when it comes to analyzing it, very cold. But they understand, <coughs> they, I have a cold, but I'm here because the news is so important. They understand their time is short. They're moving on every front. So Matt Bracken of enemiesforeignanddomestic.com joins us to break this down. You've heard in the last 10 minutes my analysis. Uh, obviously, do you agree with it, disagree with it? What, what other uh, other info can you add? My oh, intellectual I, gut tells me that the, that the real attack's coming. I totally agree with it. it. Just as far as the fake news, going a little bit on that, the CIA has employed uh, "quote unquote" journalists, you know, uh, real and fake journalists, and send them around the world to generate fake stories. You know, that have obviously they need to have a kernel of truth in them. But the, the trick is to plant the fake story in mainstream media, you know, so it, it appears to be just some legitimately sourced, uh, just organically developed news story out of Timbuktu in, you know, 1955. The CIA has been doing that from the very beginning. I mean, that's been a modus operandi. After the Church Commission, they tried to squelch that, but they, they can get around that so easily. You know, just, the Project uh, Mockingbird, well, well, what do you make of their whole fake news initiative. It seems to be blowing up in their face. Everybody knows they're the corporate globalist Soros fake news. And let's shift gears into, I'm going to skip this break because it's so important, this whole civil war push they're involved in. Well, the whole Jill Stein thing, I think we need to know where the money's coming from. Are they $5 donations or is it coming from, uh, you know, um, Soros groups? I think that the, the Zero Hedge and some other, other websites this morning have nailed it. I think it's an attempt to um, uh, Push past, push the recounts past December 19th. The December 19th is a is a hard uh, a hard date. They can't put that off. The electoral college has to vote on December 19th. If it doesn't, because they're recounting in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and so on, um, they hope to then throw it into the Congress and create a complete scene of turmoil. And I think Stephen Moore, who generally just is talking about economics, he's one of the uh, Trump economic team. He's absolutely right. I think they're trying to instigate a civil war, I would say. Since you mentioned it, here is The Economist uh, saying, uh, get ready for civil war. 
the Democrats are still in a state of denial about what happened in the election. It would be one thing, uh, Melissa, if this were election were decided by, say, just one state. But uh, for the most, uh, you know, for the most part, Donald Trump and elect won an electoral uh, landslide. I will say this: that if the Democrats challenge this and try to change the election, I think there would be a bit of a civil war in this country. And, I, and one other thing, you know, you look back at history. One of Richard Nixon's finest moment was when he did not contest the election in 1960 that may well have been stolen from him. And also say the same thing to Al Gore, who accepted the results well, uh, after they were confirmed. But I think uh, Hillary Clinton has to step up and okay. accept these results. Matt Bracken, again, former Navy SEAL, a guy that comes highly recommended by smart folks inside the Pentagon that can't come on air because of classification reasons. They say, get this guy on, he's a smart cookie, which he's proven coming on the last six months with us. I, I know he was big before I ever found him. There's just so many great people out there on the Internet, uh, which totally dominates mainstream media when you add us all together. But when InfoWars is now 126 on Quantcast, bigger than BBC, bigger than the New York Times uh, online, they're in panic mode saying they want to shut us down. Uh, but obviously... I figured this out myself and then talked to a bunch of Trump insiders. I did not bring this up when I talked to Trump. It was limited time, obviously. But I figured out he at least told them, hey, back off, take the results, I'll leave you alone. We now know Obama called, told Hillary, you know, you better concede. Hillary's now double backing on that deal. Uh, so Trump's going ahead and announcing, okay, we'll go after your foundation. Uh, I, I mean, I cannot stress to people the street fight we're in right now with 50 days out 53 days out from this, from, from his inauguration. I think they're going to pull out all the stops, false flags, you name it. So, so, so spill your guts. So well, you don't have to a, speculate. There, what do you think is going to happen? I think, this is, I think this is sort of like a game of liars poker going on. And a lot of it has to do with the calendar. There are things that Trump would say after January 20th, if he's inaugurated, that he, he dare not say now. Um, I think that the Electoral College... Uh, December 19th is a critical day, and obviously the uh, inauguration January 20th. But there's a game of liars poker. You've got cards that are, are face up, and you've got cards that are face down. You've got cards still in the deck on the bottom of the deck, up your sleeve, you know, inside of your shoe. And we're just seeing the face cards that are, you know, facing up. But that's only a tiny fraction of the game. That's like the invisible part of the iceberg. There's an entire uh, war going on right now. Um, at a at a you know un, at a hidden level, and the Jill Stein thing, I think she's just being a, she's being pushed as a patsy. Um, I think she's just being somebody's puppet, probably Soros. Hillary is going to see if it looks like it might actually work. She'll go for it. But if they if they do something to disrupt the uh, electoral college vote on the 19th, or threaten enough electoral college uh, uh, you know electors to um, change the outcome. I think that what they're hoping for is that some some uh, somebody on either side is going to pull out a rifle and say, damn it, that's the end. Um, at this point, a Lee Harvey Oswald could walk into history and change history. That's why something like what happened at OSU today immediately goes to the top of the news, because we don't know if it's a guy named Mohammed or if it's a guy named, you know, Cletus Turnbuckle from the uh, White People's Party. Uh, you know, everybody's waiting to see who it is, because it's not such, so much a matter of, you know, the uh, eight wounded, or I don't know if any have died. That's obviously an important story, but it's no more important, say, than the Chattanooga bus um, in terms of, you know, the families that are impacted. But the, the reason that it becomes immediate top of the hour news with, you know, with uh, news conferences and breaking news, et cetera, is because it, it's, uh, it has po potential political ramifications. Well, sure, notice how they said for three hours it. it was a gun. Because any type of campus emergency, when they default to emergency, you know, hide, duck, cover, you know, uh, prepare to die, whatever it is they say, it becomes a gun. Even though they knew for hours they said mass shooting with a gun, even though it was now a butcher knife, not even a, a, a machete. And look, I'm not saying it was probably Islamicist, but every time I hear about a machete or a knife, nine times out of ten it's an Islamist is doing it. And we know ISIS has called for intensified attacks on soft targets with knives. Unless it's unless it's a person having a psychotic break, because that also happens. You know, um, people will just walk into a mall and and they're you know they're seeing something that's not there. You know, they're seeing themselves in a in a delusional world where you know there are evil uh, aliens around. Sure, them they might be a superhero and they think they're taking out the aliens. A, a video game heads. Yeah, that, that, something I I jogged my memory today. You know, the the um, the biggest school massacre in history 
happened in 1927 in, in Bath Township, Michigan. Um, there were uh, 44 killed and another um, 50 or so badly injured when a, a person put dynamite in the school. This is way before the internet. It's even before that. television. It's before television. So there have always been psychotics that might do something like this. But the difference, and the reason that it's happening now is that the culture and the and television and the internet, it's a way to grab instant or immortality. You know, if you're if you're a loser in life, you can you can at least become famous and, and sure, I agree with you and I'm not for Big Brother technology, but they admit with the algorithms and things, a, a psychopath online is very easy to predict what he's gonna do. Uh, Amazon can predict when you're going to order something before you order it. Why are they not doing the profiling then when it's constitutional, if it's open source stuff you're doing? Why does the system seem to want to protect criminals and psychopaths? I don't know, but with 300 million people, just the law of averages says that even you know without uh, telegraphing in advance on Facebook or so forth, um, you know, the, like look at the guy um, uh, Omar Mateen in Orlando. Uh, you know, the, if, if they couldn't detect Omar Mateen uh, and he had been interviewed by the FBI. When his dad was on TV so, saying kill the gays. Right. So if they couldn't if they couldn't uh, dissuade or detect an, an Omar Mateen, then I, then somebody that's even further off the radar or never been on the radar is virtually impossible to. Well, detect. sure. And we know they we, they know they, they they knew he was there, but it's just like the book that's out from the former uh, government analyst that they were ordered not even look at something if it had the name Islamic in it. So, so let's well, that's, that's going to change. That's definitely going to change. You know, one of the things that Obama did was purge the uh, trainers that were um, uh, consultants to the FBI and uh, the Pentagon and so forth. Uh, fellows like the uh, man who wrote the man who wrote uh, uh, See No Evil and um, uh, the other. There are other books by the people that were kicked out. Basically, well, that, sure, the book um, See had, Something, Say Something. We had him see on. See something, say something. It's World right. Daily Books, and that guy was senior analyst. And they would have people planning stuff, and they'd say, we're not allowed to look at something that's Islamic or a mosque. They're like, but they're saying they're going to do it. And they go, it doesn't exist, because they said Islamic terror doesn't exist. Right. Both the Boston Massacre and San Bernardino are the direct result of that purge, because the people that, that did it would have been detected. For example, going to Saudi Arabia and coming back with a Pakistani madrasa-trained fanatic wife, that would have been stopped. You know, she would have been picked up at the airport, uh, uh, interrogated, et cetera. By the way, from but my view back was, then, I was, was saying, by Obama. back then I was saying, well, it must be an inside job if they knew and let them do it. But instead, it is an inside job. It's not the low-level FBI. It's the order to stand down. So I'm right. I just didn't have all the angles figured out because yeah, I'm sitting there another, watching this. A, a, another place that this is playing out right now in real time is in the military of uh, the, the fact that they can't, that soldiers cannot carry uh, personal weapons or issued weapons on base. Trump only, says he's changing that. But the military, the, the, the Obama generals, these politically correct sycophants, are putting a million catch-22 regulations in, in front of it so that it's virtually impossible to um, still carry a weapon. You know, you have to— But won't Trump just countermand all this, that? I'm sorry? Won't Trump well, just countermand it? He, he, he can have after uh, January 20th. Possibly, but um, you know there are some regulation factors that I've been reading about. If they do these, if they put in these new regulations now and it's not countermanded within 60 days, it becomes a law and it might require more than just an executive order. Well, let me ask sure. you this then, Mr. Bracken. Looking at the Islamic threat, the the tet, tet to Islam, clearly that's what's going on. They've made a deal. You said this like a year ago. And I was like, that's wild. It's confirmed. They made a deal to let them. They have TV ads on how to like cover up abusing your wife how to make people submit to you or being told they're putting women by the jibs on California and, and, and uh, UK TV, but Christians can't wear crosses. Clearly a deal's been made with radical or orthodox Islam. So what are these sleeper cells the left's brought in? What is their purpose? I th well, the, the violent sleeper cells are actually considered um, uh, uh, damaging to the cause by the much more dangerous cultural infiltrators that look at it from a generational long-term demographic point of view that we'll have seven babies each you'll have one and a half babies each and we'll outnumber you they look at the ones that actually pull the jihad the violent jihad as blowing their cover and and harming the cause so there's an internal conflict within the jihad over whether or not to do it completely by stealth and demographics or to or to um you know do violent jihad 
as ISIS has called for. So there's that internal conflict right there within the Muslim community inside of the, of the West, America, Europe, everywhere. All right. We're gonna... you, can, you can see in Germany, I mean, they're in Germany, they're you know going halal, basically. You know, they're just saying we can't win. So we're just going to take down the cross. We're going to we're going oh, to I was about uh, to say the German government is making people submit to Islam, taking down crosses, ending Oktoberfest because it makes the Muslims mad. I'm asking you, why is the left so inherently allied with it? Uh, Mr. Bracken State right there. We're going to come back I want to open the phones up as well. What do you think is coming up with this election? What do you think is coming up with the push for civil war? It's clearly going on. We're 53 days out from the inauguration. The Electoral College is on the 20th of next month. This is an incredible time. We'll give the number out when we come back. I'm Alex Jones. Stay with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I'm not here bringing up civil war and Hillary overturning the election because I want to be sensational. We're living in sensation. I am completely blown away. The toll-free number to join us is 800-259-9231. 800-259-9231. I just said 10 minutes ago, I was predicting it would be an Islamist that attacked. NBC News is saying he is an Ohio State student, a Somali refugee who lived near campus. Al-Qaeda slash ISIS put out the order three days ago to begin knife attacks. They believe it's part of the religion to kill you with a knife makes it like a holy execution or some such BS. And so there you go. CNBC, NBC, all reporting it. When I said nine times out of 10, I kind of, I don't ever want to be inaccurate. So I was trying to do math this morning when I first saw this. I was looking, I don't know knife attacks, unless it's like in Japan or China, they have them there with like psychotics, where you might have 30 attacks and then there's one crazy person like Bracken was saying this is psychotic. I just do not know. We're gonna go back to Bracken here in a moment. Before I go any further, ladies and gentlemen, we're running uh, the biggest sale so far this year. We did this last year. If you look at total sales and everything discounted to the lowest level ever, we've got scores of items discounted by 50%, like colloidal silver, storable food, one day only, 40% off, high quality. Uh, we've got 30 to 40% off all the other items, and we've got free shipping with promo code FREE, but it's only for folks listening to the radio and uh, watching on TV, you just got to put free in at checkout and you'll have free shipping. That is a big discount. And you've got this commitment. You get our products. They're great. They've changed my life. They've got five-star reviews on third-party sites like Power Reviews. Thousands. I mean, look at that. Super Mel Vitality. 1,770 plus. My eyes aren't good enough. Can you guys blow it up? I can't read it. 1,779 reviews. A 4.5 review, nobody's got that. Cold-pressed, naturally occurring substances that are known to boost your body's own intensity. Just, just try it for yourself. You'll notice real good the next few days in the morning. Let's leave it at that. Super female vitality, all of it. It's cold-pressed is the key. That's 30% off. Infowarslife.com takes you right to the supplement page. Infowarsstore.com, again, is the big umbrella main, you know, it's, it's like the shopping mall. But then made1776.com. Takes you right to the Made in America apparel or InfoWars Select. Takes you right to the storable food. InfoWarsStore.com is the main site. Or call toll-free 888-253-3139. 888-253-3139. You know, I only get sick about once every two years. And I, and I get some allergies. But almost everyone I know is sick right now. I don't have a fever. But for like a week, it's just like, uh, it's not fun. I'll just tell you that. Uh, so that's why I'm not trying to talk like Clint Eastwood here. This is this is where my voice is at uh, right now. I could probably make some money in voice offers right now with this voice. It's a weird voice, let me tell you. Uh, but uh, Matt Bracken's our guest, enemiesfarinanddomestic.com. Uh, lastly, we have third-party sponsors uh, that make this broadcast possible as well. And you can check those folks out at Solutions from Science with their pocket solar generator. Those are some science as a new pocket solar generator. It can run a lot of 110 appliances at your home. Like a small refrigerator, you can keep it, uh, your food from spoiling. But the best part is you can take it with you. It's mobile, so you can jumpstart cars, trucks, buses, even 18-wheelers with huge uh, tractors, even airplanes. Get one of these systems for your truck, your car, your wife's car, your daughter's college vehicle. You can buy one right now, and if you use coupon code ALEX at checkout, you'll get a second one free. 
plus a bunch of off-the-grid bonuses that are free, too. It's a great deal. So claim one today at PowerGrid, privatepowergrid.com. That's privatepowergrid.com, privatepowergrid.com. And then finally, Revelations, Dawn of Global Government film, myself, Charlie Daniels, and many others like Gerald Salente, uh, you name it. I can't list everybody. Joel Skousen covers the whole New World Order takeover. It's very powerful, important. People see this film, Revelation, Dawn of Global Government, available right now. You can order it on DVD or set up a screening in your area at revelationthemovie.info. That's revelationthemovie.info, revelationthemovie.info. Now, going back to former Navy SEAL, best-selling author and researcher, Dave, uh, Matt Bracken of enemiesforeignanddomestic.com. David Knight is hosting in the fourth hour today. We'll also be taking your phone calls. You know, do we, getting so close to this problem, Matt, not telegraph to people, like I said earlier, this isn't rhetoric. They're trying a recount. I said Hillary was behind it over a week ago. She admitted it two days ago. Um, just like I said, this is probably a jihadi attack that's now admitted. I mean, it just gets more and more obvious. We have people running the country that literally hate prosperity because their systems of command and control can't compete with it. What else is on your big board? What else are you looking for? And how do we get aggressive? Because here's the deal. I don't, I'm not trying to shoot my mouth off, but a week and a half ago at breakfast when a guy followed me out for no reason from the diner, my son got another car with my cousin. They were going to go off. I had friends with me. And the guy showed me his gun and like bowed up and stuff. And I caught myself and I'm not bragging. I didn't have a gun with me. The truck, the vehicle's full of guns behind me. Getting, starting to get out as his wife tugged him and he ran around the corner. I'm not trying to act tough. I was going to go over there and beat the living hell out of him. And I'm not trying to act tough. It's just, it's, it's, it's what I do. I have a problem running. In fact, I get high when somebody is trying to attack me. Like you're in my face. I'm going to tear you apart. But. I'm actually realized this job is more important and getting the word out is more important. So I'm going to try to more and we've, more. We've seen, we've seen that on, we've seen that on camera when I, I, I try to avoid uh, public demonstrations anymore because I get, I get too um, hyped up also. I mean, I, I, I uh, tend to go right towards it and, and get in their face when they're in my face. Exactly. I'm not saying I'm a tough guy, but I've got buttons they can push. So I'm kind of going into a fortress mode now, not allowing right. myself because they're everywhere I go, they're, they're, they're getting in my face now. What does that signify to you? Because there is a real hysteria. I mean, I've... Well, I've the, media is fa the media and Obama and the Democrats in general have been fanning it up. Every time a cop is shot sitting in his car... I blame that on Obama. That goes all the way back through his entire uh, presidency, is whipping up this hatred of police um, to where we're, where you know they're shoving uh, people into subway tracks, saying basically I hate white people. So that the the knockout game is now becoming the subway game. So you're afraid of, around mass transportation, somebody's just going to take the chance to shove you onto the tracks. Well, that hatred has been generated and whipped up by the Democrats and the media. I, I see a huge media battle right now. The, the old media is trying to call it the alt-right media. Um, I call it just the new media. I would say the new media is better. The rebirth or, of media. And, yeah. and I apologize for getting to myself. I'm, I'm actually psychoanalyzing on air the point that these people get in my face. They menace me. They're assaulting me. I'm not saying I'm even going to win the fight. I have a problem that I want to fight them when they assault me you know, verbally or, or threaten me well, physically. So let me I ask think you, you should... I think you should send a Christmas card to Steve Bannon because he's become the number one whipping boy of the new media um, instead of you for the time being. Right now, what the what the old media is trying to do is to conflate uh, Breitbart, uh, this this uh, jackwad, uh, Mr. Spencer, who has like a following that you know could meet in a hotel room, but the 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 old old mainstream media puts the cameras on him and tries to make it look like, you know, the rise of uh, Hitler in, in Bavaria. Uh, you know, they're, they're in a, they're in a, um, a symbiotic relationship, this little pipsqueak. Uh, sure, nobody. I want to talk about that, and, I, and I've talked a little bit to Bannon, uh, actually, and they are attacking him 10 times more than they are me. I only get like 50 articles a day saying, disavow me for saying Sandy Hook didn't happen. I never said that. I said they clearly had actors there. They exacerbated it. They pumped it up to demonize the Second Amendment. They take that out of context. But they're definitely wanting to cut Trump out of the real patriots that are, that are supporting him or in his administration. But let's shift back to what you just said about dead cops. I don't have some 
Francophile worship of French or Anglophile worship of British uh, or other jock sniffing such deals for what a group is. I, I'm all about individuals. But I, again, I'm not in some cop worship fest, except that I've noticed cops tend to be more awake than the general public and more involved. Are there bad cops? Absolutely. Are there bad cops? Totally. But the fact that the Soros and the globalists would demonize cops as the main enemy and act like they run the show and say they're all racist and then have eight of them killed the last week, murdered. And then when I put videos out, they only get 300, 400,000 views. When my other videos get three, four, five million, I'm actually ashamed of America that we know the name of Trayvon Martin and all these other people that started it and that these cops that were killed pumping gas or changing tires or riding a ticket or at a, or at a wreck, we don't even know their names. Nobody cares. That lets me know this. When I get killed, nobody's going to care about me. So it's an automatic kinship to experience being demonized and people out to get you and being hunted. And your fellow countrymen don't give a damn. You've been dehumanized all because you're not a traitor. And I'll be honest, yes. I see these communists. I'm going to be honest. I want to get in my car. I want to go down there and beat the sh crap out of them because I'm sick of their crap. They're in every day in Austin and all over the country and on tape saying, kill me too. And, and are threatening our female reporter. And they're allowed to walk around with loaded guns saying, kill cops in Austin. And I want to ask a question. That's terrorism. Why are they allowed to do that? These people are scum. Why are we waiting while they foment people to go kill cops right here in Texas? I fundamentally well, they're, they're, am pissed. Well, they're piling they're piling tinder up in the gunpowder factory and throwing matches in. Uh, it's all part of the same piece. You know, they're they're, they're and they need to the, pay. That's what I'm saying. The They'll get some lost. poor black person who's brain dead. You know, from all the culture brainwashing to go kill a cop. These little skinny neck communists, they're not killing anybody. They sit around like they're better than us directing all this. And I'm asking a question. Why aren't their asses in jail right now? If I was calling for killing cops with loaded guns in downtown Austin, I deserve to be arrested. If I was, if they were calling for killing male men, I'd say they need to be arrested. This is BS. So I'm asking you, Matt Bracken, why is the government putting up with it? Well, right now we're in the last days of Obama. And sometimes when a, when a light bulb right before it pops and goes out, it gets real bright and starts flickering and acting crazy. Have you ever noticed that? Yes. You know, an old, fil an old filament light bulb. Up. I think that the, that the mainstream media and the Democrats, they're all in the George, George Soros, the Democrats, mainstream media, they realize they've got until, you know, a December 19th. Yeah, why is he still walking president. around? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, it, for one thing, he's probably extremely well guarded and very careful, and you know, moves only on his own private jets. But um, it'll be an, it, it's very interesting to see what's going to happen if after Trump is in and he's got the reins of power because they they do appear to be going for broke and just piling the you know they're throwing gasoline on a uh, bonfire right now, basically whipping up hatred against cops. They're still going with the hands up, don't shoot false narrative, you know, which is a lie, which, you know, led to a lot of the uh, anger that, you know, the whole BLM movement based on a lie. Same thing with uh, with uh, Trayvon Martin based on a lie. So they're obviously they're they're I guess you would call them psychological arsonists and you know, the media and the Democrats, George Soros, they're all on the same team, but they've only got a few more weeks and then they're out of they're out of power. They're going to be on the sideline. And, it, you know, they'll still have some power. But right now, we already saw that the old media was beat down by the new media. Well, sure, they that's my next question then, Matt Bracken. That's my next question. I'm not vindictive. I'm not authoritarian. We can't leave this cancer here who's authoritarian, anti-freedom, wants to overthrow our system. What do we do then once Trump gets in? I mean, these people have overthrown other countries. They've funded ISIS. They've overthrown all these other uh, nations like Ukraine. We can't just let them sit there and reconstitute and call for our killings. I mean, the communists on their websites call for my death. I go to the police department and file a complaint. They go, we're sorry, we can't do anything. That's wrong. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next couple of weeks. You know, the, the media is the overt propaganda arm of Soros and the Democrat Party. They work, they work together. They're a team. Um, but they couldn't get Hillary elected despite day after day lying, coming out with obviously completely bogus polls. Now they've lost all their credibility. More and more people are going to InfoWars, Breitbart and Drudge to get their news. So the, the more hysterical and shrill they get, 
trying to you know call Steve Bannon a, a racist. Um, they they're still calling him an anti-Semite based on a you know a single headline which was written uh, an article written by David Horowitz about another Jewish fellow, uh, Bill Crystal, I believe. Yeah, he said renegade now, Jew. One Jew yeah. called another Jew for being liberal renegade. What the hell? That's not anti-Semitic. But the propaganda, the Soros, uh, ABC and NBC. Yeah, CBS, meanwhile, Soros rounded up that. thousands of Jews and robbed them, but he's okay. Well, they'll never get into that. But YouTube doesn't go away, though. And this is where I, I think that there is some hope because, you know, based on my children, they don't watch TV to get the news. They hear about something, they go straight to YouTube. So things like the uh, Soros interview from a few years back, they're, on, they're not going to go he's away. He's proud of supporting Hitler, exactly. So let right. me ask you this question. Where do they go as they're defeated? Because I agree with you, we are defeating them. They're freaking out. Almost at a sick level, I just hope they bring it and stage some stuff because everything they do is going to blow up in their face. I think they're, they're going for that burning down the house scenario. And at the very top, the ones that aren't the street agitators, but the ones that are the you know highest financiers at the Soros level, I think that they're not worried that they can go anywhere. They've got jets with global capability. They've got you know mansions and guards on every continent. So I think that at their level, they, they don't care. They'll come back and buy the rubble you know uh, on pennies on the dollar um, after the Civil War. They'll but, never get away with it. But at the, at the very top, the way I look at it, George Soros, uh, based on his age, how he looks, how he sounds, I think he's probably going to these Swiss clinics and getting his, you know, very special rejuvenations, uh, which is probably very closely tied in with some very evil satanic type of deals. Yeah, let's um, just say it. it's, it's, it's children's blood transfusions. And, yeah, that's right. And, and but even he has to know he's running out of time. And as a megalomaniac, uh, egomaniac, atheist. I think that he believes he has to go for it now. He has to burn down the house That's now. the danger. I totally agree. You've got all these old evil globalists that think they see it all slipping. They're going to double down. Nothing's more dangerous than some old guy that thinks his time is up. Right. And I don't think that George Soros has no hope of being global dictator of the world or the world's richest man. That's not what motivates. He just wants like to that. bring down America. He wants to be he wants to, in, in essence, put himself on Mount Rushmore, a virtual Mount Rushmore, in the sense of being someone that every history book, when you turn to 2017, there has to be a chapter on George Soros, how he blew up the world, that that no matter what you think of him, like like Fidel Castro, you know, no matter what you think of him, Skip the break. he's part of the history book. And that's his motivation. And I, And speaking of Fidel. His funeral is going to be one of these rare litmus tests. Who goes? Who goes there as a sycophant, you know, uh, apologist for tyranny and mass murder, and and who just sends nobody? That's right. Imagine that if Trump powers. would have killed, even Castro admits, 200,000 people, millions in prison, funding revolutions all over the world. And I'll, I'll give it to him. He was, he was less of a killer than other communists. And I get it. Well, He's he a manly guy. He's a survival, survival of these death threats. I don't dislike him as a man. But to worship him and to laud him when he was such a monster is a joke. Right. And and if you lived in Colombia uh, during, you know, from the from the 70s until so recently, or if you lived in, in uh, Peru during the 1980s, Sendero Luminoso and the, and the FARC were every bit as evil as uh, as Boko Haram or ISIS. They also did ritual torture slayings, you know, recruitment of children, forced recruitment of children, uh, uh, reprisals where they massacred entire villages, including torture massacres. So th and that was that was all funded by Cuba. You know, that was uh, Cuban agents, Cuban funds. So, yeah, I, I defy uh, Sean Penn and Danny Glover and these people to go to go to Cuba after it's free. They'll chase you in the streets. The, the Cuban people right now, I mean, the, our stooge they media, they go down to Cuba and they say, oh, the Cubans are very quiet. They're very, uh, they're pensive. They seem to be in a pensive attitude. Sure, because they still can't protest or say, I'm glad he's dead. They'll wind up we in We saw people mildly protest when Obama was there, drug away and put in police cars. And let's expand on that. You, yeah, look, they, you look at what communists have done all over the world, and I'm ashamed of our teams in Vietnam that did execute village leaders and people, they were losing to the communists who would kill whole villages. That's what Apocalypse Now is all about.
that's based on some composite real stories where some of our own colonels said, okay, we'll do communist tactics and started winning where you'd kill whole villages if they didn't go along with you. But then they blame us. Our history only tells us what we did trying to beat them adopting communist tactics when the point is it's the communists that wrote those damn tactics. And, well, and as you Phoenix, said, Latin America, death squads killing everybody, men, women, and children, but it's all cute and funny when they do it. You know, well, I, I, I know something about Phoenix program because of uh, I, was in, uh, I was in the teams as a young man, and, and the people that were my instructors were there. They were part of it. I knew PRU instructors, Provincial Reconnaissance Unit, or, or uh, folks that went out with Phoenix program. Seals, sheep dipped, wearing you know uh, native uniforms. They weren't just going into villages and shooting people. I gotta argue with you there. No, I understand. They, they were killing. They were killing the leaders of it. Sources. They knew who the VC guys. A VC guy could be a member of the Saigon government. You know, a VC well, listen. Guy then let's go back then. The Tell us the truth of that. All I know is the congressional hearings where they said a lot of large portions of villages, the males got killed, obviously they're military. My point is the communists killed everybody, but all our media tells us about is what we did. So so tell us. Well, I, I don't know anything about other than, you know, uh, obviously there were massacres like my lie, but we, you know, we eventually the word got out and there were some other, but it's more of a case like uh, the, 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 Immigrant in New York named Amon Diallo. He got shot like 30 times by the police. Well, they've got three undercover detectives on a you know anti-rape squad pointing Glocks at you. Somebody sneezes, a car backfires, everybody's going to shoot. That didn't mean they went out that night to put 30 bullets into an innocent man. Um, and there were massacres that were basically, you know, uh, somebody fires or somebody screams. No, no, I, I, listen, I get the fog of war. I, I was only bringing that's, the story up to say going to communist to wrote, village. sure, communist wrote the book, though, correct, on massacring right. whole villages. And including in Colombia and in Peru, where they did it for, you know, uh, for decades. And that was straight out of of Cuba. And, and don't anybody forget also, because and this is declassified after the fall of the Soviet Union, Fidel Castro is so crazy and such an egomaniac monster that during the, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, he was urging Khrushchev to launch a first strike, even if it meant Cuba being wiped off the face of the earth, as long as America was wiped and off the expand. face And let's expand. Hugh, uh, absolutely. Then look at the nightmare of Hugo Chavez, but go to Che Guevara, who wrote books calling Native Americans, Indians, subhuman trash. I mean, uh, people don't know that they imprisoned gays and, and, and anti-war liberals and everybody else, China has, uh, homosexuality is outlawed in China. They'll kill you for it, and the left worships it. That's what I mean. Islam says they'll kill them, but the left worships it. What is happening? Well, the, the useful idiots are trained in college. They just, they, they get the Howard Zinn version of history, unfortunately. But, you know, the last election, it gives us cause for a lot of hope because despite pulling out all the stops and turning American media into just pure lying propaganda, the American people, enough okay. American people saw through Sure, it Hillary stole Trump. five states and still failed, but they've only intensified the race baiting now. So where does that go? Well, the, the next, from now until, what, three weeks until uh, December 19th is going to be very pivotal in history. Any act like the, a, a Somali that stabs eight people, the importance of it will be vastly magnified. It will have a, a leverage, you know, a multiplier effect. Um, well, the media will say the Tea Party did it, but yeah, no, it's obviously Islamic. They, yeah, they wish that it was somebody named, you know, named uh, Cletus Johnson, but it wasn't. Um, go figure. But what they would like to do is, you know, you, you saw up in Amherst, they burned the flag, then the vet veterans showed up. They're trying to instigate something where and my fear is uh, if, if a highway is blocked, uh, somebody's just going to get out and dump a mag into the protesters. Or sure, so the answer is don't be violent. Drive over them. Don't be violent. Let them push and push. Uh, the key is getting, getting the Electoral College done the 20th and then just moving forward from there. That's right. And don't, but they're, they, would, they need somebody with a white face and a southern background to do something evil. You know, that Dylan Roof, uh, they said he's not mentally competent, but um, I, ha I have I wonder about that personally. But what they're hoping for is another Dylan Roof type of an event. All right. Uh, listen, I got a bunch of callers. If you want to eject, you're welcome to. If you want to take these callers from Mark, Chris, Howard, Andrew and Jim for about 20 minutes the next hour, you can. Uh, sure, again, we've got, 
fantastic. Enemiesforeigndomestic.com. Matt Bracken is our guest. We're going to come back to you then in about a minute or two after this break and go right to your phone calls. I want to tell listeners something right now. Um, wild horses <laughs> couldn't drag me away from this because history is happening. And Hillary is trying through Jill Stein to block this election right now. They've had Rince Priebus have to come out and admit, okay, it's serious. They want to overturn the election. I knew this two weeks ago. They were already harassing and threatening electors in the news. But I, I, I got calls and confirmed with electors in Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania that they are being, their kids are being threatened. And I mean, cars pulling up in their yards, stuff being done. I mean, I don't mean just death threats over the telephone. So the, the globalist mafia is in full swing. And I'm just sitting back thinking, what do we do to push back? You know, I don't want violence. I agree with Bracken. We need to, like, stop and absolutely tap down on that. But, man, then I think about it. If we actually do get into power, George Washington, you know, would have arrested every one of these people. Because these aren't Americans, folks. These are globalist enemy combatants. They, I mean, I'm telling you. The gloves have to be Thank taken off. I'm serious. I mean, I'm not a violent person. The I will volunteer when they get convicted today. to kick that switch and hang their ass. Many Cuban Americans here at Versailles Cafe, the political epicenter of this community in Miami, telling me this morning they cannot believe some of the world reaction from figures like Justin Trudeau and Jill Stein about Fidel Castro, some of the reactions you were talking about just earlier in the show. But they tell me they are especially hurt and ashamed, one even used the word humiliated, by President Obama's statement regarding Fidel Castro, the president calling Castro a singular figure who had enormous impact, but didn't really using uh, the word uh, dictator. Now, on the other hand, many here, the Bay of Pages veterans, uh, the women in white, uh, they are, you know, praising and thanking Donald Trump for his statement, the president-elect calling Castro a brutal dictator who oppressed his own people. And remember, guys, more than half of Cuban Americans supported Donald Trump in the election, and they are now looking to him to see what will happen with with U.S.-Cuba policy. Wow. So I'm really ashamed of people like Jesse Ventura coming out and saying how great Fidel Castro was. I don't know. I don't I've known Jesse for like 10 years, been friends with him, but just give me a break. I can't put up with this anymore. Where, where everybody just sits here and this guy's killed hundreds of thousands. He's exported war to Africa, exported war to Latin America, funded death squads with Che Guevara. And then I've got to sit there and romanticize him and kiss his ass. If Trump did any of this, we'd all be against him. I would too. But that everything Trump does is fascist and evil. It's just so one-sided. And then I see this Kaepernick who makes $100 million plus dollars. He's made like $180 million total in his career in the NFL. Bitching about America. People go, hey, don't censor him. It's not censoring about criticizing. We're going to come back in the next long segment and break all this down, but... There's just something oxymoronic about a guy worth hundreds of millions of dollars bitching about America, talking about how great Fidel Castro is, who's never studied how Fidel Castro took thousands of farmers' families and just killed them so they could take their land. A lot of poor farmers. Matt Bracken, we were getting into this. It's a short segment, but, but you know, looking at this, this worship of Fidel, I agree with you. It's a real watermark. It's, it's a real gauge to see where people stand. Not, not only to see what world leaders go to his funeral, it's very interesting to me that, and it shows that Raul is probably afraid right now. They're not having the funeral in Havana, and I don't think that they're even having any mass uh, mourning, like, you know, lying in state, anything like that. And that tells me that they're afraid because a, a funeral can get out of control. A funeral, uh, if you allow a funeral, you can't tell if 100,000 might come. Now, they used to bust in hundreds of thousands, but for a, a funeral like this, they, they must fear, what if three or four or five million Cubans show up and then the crowd just turns and says, let's go get Raul? At that point, will, would the police fire on them? Like, you know, in, in uh, Romania, at the end of the, at the, end of the, um, the fall, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, Ceausescu and his wife said, we're not leaving, we're not going anywhere. They brought in goons like uh, union miners, things like that. They bust in goons with uh, pickaxes to try to beat down the, the dissidents and protesters, but it didn't work. And even putting machine guns on the roof of the palace didn't work. That's right. Giving them the opportunity to fight was their end. They, they miscalculated. And then they dragged Ceausescu out and shot him and his wife. That They call that Romanian term limits. And I'm, I think that's why they're... 
Yeah, I think that's why they're having this um, the uh, uh, Fidel funeral in a remote location that millions of people won't be able to get to unless they're bust in. You know, I know. With he's hated in his own country, but every little fake pseudo intellectual tells us how great he is when the guy but was a very, dirtbag. It, it's very telling that he's not having, he's not laying in state or laying, you know, laying in, uh, in to be viewed in Havana. They're taking him to some place that's remote so that they can control the roads and only bus in supporters. That tells me they're afraid of a mass revolution. A funeral can be a, a big turning point. You know, funerals are very dangerous. You see that in Israel when, you know, Palestinian terrorists are killed. They'll try to... Stay there. We're going to come back with calls. Good point. If we just bet on America, what well, made this country great, and realize that the globalists are in competition with the American system, we're going to the stars. <sighs> I want to go to Mark, Chris, Howard, Andrew, Jim, and others. I am such a liberal in the Thomas Jefferson vein that I can't stand Islam. I certainly can't stand Orthodox Islam. But I went to high school and college with some nice you know, Muslim folks. And I was against these wars because it was the wrong countries being targeted. But I got to tell you, watching the establishment and the globalists ally themselves with the worst forms of Islam, and then just every day I have to look at it where they've got TV ads in Germany saying submit to Islam, paid for by the UN. They've got Moroccan ads saying when you bust your wife's nose up with her black eye, here's how you put makeup on to cover up. I mean, the whole culture is about infiltrating and taking over. And I've got stacks of articles here where they're just killing homosexuals. They're doing all this other crap. All I want is homosexuals not to recruit my kids or anybody else. I don't care if you had a sexual homosexual. Keep your damn hands off my kids unless you've got a death wish. And then I've got, it, and we played this a few weeks ago, but now that's a new, it's on the news in Italy. Italy's Minister of Interior, surrender your homes to migrants or face jail. They don't even pay you to house them. There's the famous footage from two weeks ago of Luigi, 80 years old, Tiny little inn with like 10 rooms. He's got a little restaurant. They just say, hey, everything's free. Here they are. And they bring in the Muslims. And these big old six foot four cops just shove the old man aside. Hell, you can't go to North Africa, Tunisia, or Libya or do this. It's, it's like a death wish of the goodwill and like all these special ops looking Italian goons shoving old men around and taking their place over. I mean, I get, I'm not somebody on the air that calls for violence, but, I mean, you're really hitting my buttons at this point. And I agree with Bracken. We don't need to go that way. But, I mean, they are just testing and pushing and moving the Overton window to see what they can do. And then I see this. It's all over MSNBC. It's all over BBC. Half the time I tune into BBC because I've got two different BBC channels on my cable. It's women in hijabs. I mean, this is the most oppressive system you can imagine. Canada celebrates hijab wearing news anchor while Christian crosses are banned on the same network. They've even got the reporter who was kicked off because she wanted to wear a cross. Of course, in most countries, you don't wear a hijab, you wear a burqa. And how they got all the liberals selling this, it just, I just, I just don't get it anymore. And then I've got all these other articles here. Indonesian woman flogged for close proximity with a man. Yahoo News, AP. I've got like, you know, a couple men were meeting for hamburgers in Indonesia, so they thought they were gay and came and arrested them. After the beating, Moroccan TV airs makeup tips for hiding domestic violence. It's like, <clears throat> and then before I even really went on this, this crusade against Orthodox Islam a few years ago, they put out major movies. Cross, what's that big director, comedian's name? They did Mr. Show and all that? David Cross. They've got two-hour films that were in theaters locally. I, I went in and saw in the theater where the guy goes, I hate black people and Jews and Muslims. I'm Alex Jones. I'm going to kill people. You're sitting there with a Slurpee in your hand watching this. It's like, what the hell is going on with Hollywood that wants access to our kids and wants to tell us what to do? And then they're in a love fest with Saudi Arabia, who's buying up Hollywood along with the communist Chinese. And then two weeks ago... The communist Chinese were all over the news, AP, Wall Street Journal, saying, you better shut down the alt-right or we're going to pull our money out of your treasuries. So I've now reached a point at 42 years old, about to be 43, that movie's called Hits, where 
I'm, I'm living in another world where the communist Chinese that killed more people than anybody in history are telling the news, shut me down, and are telling Trump, get rid of Stephen Bannon. Now, it's not a heady situation. It's more of an awakening. I guess that shows actually how weak they are. The problem is they got nuclear weapons. What will they pull to stop it? So commenting on that, Bracken, then we're going to take some calls. You want to say what's the rest of the hour, you're welcome. And, and again, what else do you see them doing? Because they're so arrogant, they're so mentally ill, they don't realize <laughs> that they're Hitler in the bunker in 1945. I still think, because I've noticed delusional people that never really earn what they had, as they get more power, they get on a bigger power trip. As I get more power, I get more concerned and more, more humble and more worried about what I do. I'm really worried, though, about the paradigm. I think they're crazy enough to try anything. And I think in the next, as you said, three weeks till the Electoral College, but even into the election in, in, in 53 days, I think we're in the most dangerous time in human history. What do you think? Very, very dangerous. But they're, they're lashing out and panicking about the new media. You know, I, I, uh, shows to me that they're very afraid. It's like Fidel not Fidel's uh, funeral not being in Havana. That's a huge sign of weakness and fear. They tried to ignore the new media, then they tried to ridicule it. Now it's the you know, Russian trick. It's all a Russian conspiracy. You know, nobody's buying it. That's why Trump won. They've played their card. They've gone, you know, uh, completely to the end of the rope of calling everybody a racist. Now they're trying to conflate. Breitbart and Steve Bannon with this nut job, uh, uh, Richard Spencer, uh, to make them make you know ordinary people think that you know it's like a new coming of Hitler, but it's not working. It's the, it's their panic. It's the end of their road, and I, now that they're 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 trying to uh, infer that we're all something now we never heard of last year. Now we're all white if you happen to be Caucasian. I mean, if your parents parents came from Europe. I had nothing to do with, you know, the color of my skin or the color of my eyes. I just was born this way. But now apparently I'm a white nationalist. They're trying to make patriots who are Americans and who happen by just the grace of, you know, the luck of the odds, the luck of the draw to be Caucasian. Now we're somehow scary white nationalists. So no, I, I agree with you. Let's just be honest. Uh, I say thinking or whatever it is. Every group has its talent, its skill on average. Everybody's diverse. But it's like, you know, Kenyans are all the top long-distance runners. What is it about Europe that had its own problems that developed so much science, so much renaissance, and ended slavery and tried to empower women? I think the despots are in competition with the true liberalism of the white male. I mean, not that we're perfect, but I think they're really scared of the fact that we want to, on average, empower people. So they try to focus in on dumbasses. Well, they've, they've, they've done a very good job of sabotaging, you know, Europeans from within. I mean, you can, the evidence is the birth rate, the you know, a collapsing demographic birth rate where people are so demoralized or into hedonism that they don't even want to have children. So that, you know, Italy is at like 1.0 uh, children per white. Yeah, Italy's the worst, you're right. So they're, so, they're, you know, they're going to either- What a great collapse. culture dying. I mean, I'm not Japanese, but they're second to, to Italy is the worst. I'm so sad the Japanese are fading into history. But yet the Japanese are at least saying we're going to do it as Japanese. If we can't figure out how robots will take care of our old people, then, you know, but we'll, we're not just going to bring in millions of Muslims. That's for. Yeah, don't be, you have you to know, hand the genocide. Japanese. I mean, when things get worse, they have a lower crime rate. I, I, I mean, Japanese. Yeah, are pretty after, after, Fukush, after Fukushima, I mean, it's legendary that you can leave a bicycle on the street or your wallet on the subway. After Fukushima, the equivalent of their uh, Walgreens and Walmarts had to put signs on the doors saying, please take everything you need, because even starving Japanese wouldn't go into a broken drugstore and get out bottled water. I mean, it's, it tells you something about their culture. Now, obviously, World War II, they were fanatical in some very bad ways, but goodness, they do take care of their people, and, uh, and they're not just going to be, they don't have politicians that will just volunteer to have them genocided by you know, Islamist maniacs coming well, in. That's right. Uh, you know? Japan will not let one Islamic in. Yeah. And, you know, as far as going back, I want to get this out. If we're going to now be called white nationalists, if Steve Bannon, they're going to keep showing Steve Bannon and and you and uh, and, you know, next to the, the worst of the worst of these, you know, marginal fringe. Nobody ever heard of them until the mainstream media. I never heard comes. of this guy they're saying I'm best buddies with. So right. I so I say I say that. The, the, the mainstream media talking heads, all of them, the Democrats, I have a new term for them, P-I-S, 
progressive international socialists. If they can not only call us nationalists, which I'll wear that proudly, I'm a national populist. I'm a patriot, a patriotic American. If they're going to turn that into somehow I'm a racist because my skin's white, that means I must be a white nationalist. I say take the gloves off. You said, what can we do? Well, we don't want to get in their face and turn it into a shooting war, at least not before uh, December 19th or January. But I say let's not play their game of using their terminology. I call Brian Williams, Rachel Maddow, all of them. They're international socialists. If they hate me for being a patriotic American nationalist, then I say, screw you, pal. You're an international socialist, which is just the overt of polite form of saying you're a communist. If you go to Fidel's uh, funeral, you're a communist. You know what he did, and you're going to go and honor him. You're a communist. Well, As here's I the deal. It. I mean, they're demonizing. Yeah, yeah. They're Rest demonizing. The sure, we're going to skip this break. They're demonizing Trump for doing nothing, and then Fidel Castro is a mass murderer. I mean, if I killed one person in cold blood, I would expect my family would disown me. The guy killed hundreds of thousands. Robbed. I mean, you, you, folks, I've studied history. <sighs> Cuba was like more wealthy than Florida or Texas. It had the biggest middle class except for Argentina or Venezuela. There were three rich hubs in the Caribbean and in Central and South America. <laughs> it was Argentina, Cuba, and Venezuela. And all those places are socialist hellholes now with just total collapse because they the, the elites wanted to get rid of the middle class. And Cuba had a big, fat, juicy middle class. They were successful. They were, the, but but they got a lot of poor people pissed. Going, hey, look, somebody's got a nice car. Somebody, you would have got a car the next year, dummy. You know, oh, look, these rich casino owners are making money. These hotel owners, these foreign, you know, Yankee pigs are here investing. Yeah, of course, it's a freaking nice country. And now, what do you have? Sixty years later, a hellhole, and. It's, it's so sad, but don't worry, we're under the same attack. And I just feel so sorry, because there was a saying 60 years ago, as rich as an Argentine or as rich as a Venezuelan, or, or they even say in the 50s, is, you know, that you know, those rich Cubans, because the average American was in a two-bedroom house with one bathroom, if they were lucky, if they were middle class. And then the Cubans had better than that. It's all gone. And, and our liberal media were helped in that, helped to install these dictators you know, whether it was uh, New York Times uh, Durante being a they all, for Stalin. The New York Times, the Washington Post talked about Fidel like he was a rock star. Like they did about Stalin during the uh, Ukraine Holodmore genocide, the starvation genocide. They were knowing, they knew about what was going on and they were saying, oh, I've seen yeah, the future. Yeah, but see, Matt Taibbi doesn't, doesn't know about that genocide or doesn't know about the Armenian genocide. He just foppishly walks real slow and goes, oh, liberal, oh, I had a coffee, oh, liberal. How do you counter the fake pseudo-intellectualism? Because, I mean, I study all the time. I can tell talking to you, you've done major study, so we're on the same field here. I talk to, a like, a, a fake or a fop, and I talk to a liberal. They don't know anything. They ju Even their top people just go, oh, yeah, right, sure, racist. And I'm like, well, hey, we, we have a we have a great opening. There's a great opportunity here. And I and I think that, you know, we've already maybe passed the high water mark for liberalism. And now it's go, the tides going our way, running our way, because these people that these kids that have only learned history from Howard Zinn textbooks, you know, evil America invented slavery, that that false history. <laughs> they're they are ripe to have their eyes opened. They don't know about Che Guevara, except that he's got a cool T-shirt. So they are, Did you know they he wrote two learn. books? I personally even ordered one of the ones in Spanish where he calls black people animals and where he says Mexicans sure. are dumb cockroaches. Lazy. And, you know, yeah, yeah, lazy cockroaches. So you've but, read that. Yeah, there's, so there's a, there's a big opportunity But see now how weird it is? I can converse with you and you know what Che Guevara really said. I tell some weird little commie kid wearing it, they, don't, they just laugh at me. I mean, you know. Well, you won't be able to get them all, but I, I, I think that a, one good approach, um, is, uh, Dennis Prager, you know, another great talk host, he's got something called Prager University. It's excellent. Where he has, I want to get Dennis Prager on, and by And they're the way. five minutes. They're just like five-minute episodes. So there are five-minute teachable lessons that make the best points possible, you know, with simple graphics. So there, there are millions of people out there 
right now that are wondering, like, what is this argument about Fidel Castro? I know they got funky old cars in Havana. Why is that? But they've never heard that he had they had walls where people were just taken out and shot night after night. They would never heard that. So there is an opportunity to to undo the learning. Uh, there's a good thing about these uh, snowflakes is that they're empty vessels. You know, the first message whispered into their ear was the false Howard. No, no, I agree. I agree. And, you know, they can be reeducated very quickly to the, with the truth very quickly. Yeah, they're just but, so entitled and so whacked out. I want to go to some phone calls now. Uh, we're talking to Matt Bracken of EnemiesFarmDomestic.com, Alex Jones with InfoWars.com. Uh, we're sitting here talking. We've got 53 days till the inauguration in January 20th. Uh, we've got the Democrats and Hillary trying to overthrow the election, even though she pledged she believed Trump won. That's because she'd stolen five states and still failed. But notice Jill Stein is not auditing those states that she, she won. Uh, this is just, this is outrageous, and it shows they're setting the precedent for riots. All they're waiting for, as Mr. Bracken said, is for somebody to shoot a crowd of Black Lives Matter people. And I think cities burn all over the country. I want to That's go to what they're hoping for. So, so let's quantify this. I'm going to take a call before we go to break and come back and take calls. If you're sitting there at Soros right now, I mean, I'm 42, and I'm, I'm smarter business-wise, knowledge-wise, but, I mean, I'm tired. I can't imagine being 87 or 89 like Soros, and I catch he's at meetings all over the world. He's involved in everything. Where does this energy come from? And, I mean, what is going on with this guy? It's like, what the hell is happening here? I think that he wants to be considered one of the key figures in all of history, um, in, in a history book that shows, you know, Hitler, Lenin, Stalin, whether you think they're evil or whether you think they, you know, made the autobahns or, you know, uh, whatever they did that was, you know, they built canals where millions were killed to build the, the White Sea Canal. Uh, it doesn't matter. If you're in the history book, that's what drives some people. So it's a Just selfishness. Like it's, a, it's pissing on the world. Just like a mass murderer at a very small, you know, granular level, somebody that, you know, uh, takes a rifle and goes up on a building, he's trying to beat the last death count so that people will remember his name, even if he's dead. So it's, an, it's, it's, it's it. a true narcissistic, psychopathic mental illness. But at the very top level, I think that what drives George Soros is that, I mean, he knows he's going to die, and he, I think that he believes he's just worm food after that. The thought that comforts him is that every history of the 20th and 21st century, he is going to be a key figure. When they show the pictures of the presidents and of, of dictators, they will also show and have a chapter on George Soros. And that, I think, is what motivates him. It's not making more money. It's not staying alive. No, I agree. And, and it's twisted. True human power is about telegraphing knowledge forward to help others, not out of arrogance, but out of love and a wish to be with those before you, currently, and, and after you. That's true well, people, human spirit. He wants to take that and twist it. When you watch the when you watch the uh, video where he was very candid about his youth and he and, laughed uh, about it, he said, "I'm proud of helping the Nazis," and didn't feel any. It, the, so there was something you know happened. Uh, something scarred him in his youth that took out empathy and replaced it with something cold and calculating. He said, "He said you know, I won by helping the Nazis, and I'm going to go on winning." Right. So I. Oh, no, he would have won by killing ten of them, and not being a piece of filth. If he hadn't have been damaged psychologically in some way, you know that uh, I forget which of the uh, the Anthony Hopkins movie uh, Hannibal, you know, there, there's the early Charles scene Lambs. where he's where he's a child, where he's a child and he's watching uh, horrors. Uh, I think that some people come out of um, trauma at the correct age. You know, if you if if you're pushed into a lake as a three year old, believe me. You're never going to want to go swimming for the rest of your life. If a if a big spider bites you uh, when you're a, an infant, you're going to have spider phobia. So, I think it's very possible that whatever happened to George Soros in uh, Eastern Europe set him on the path that he's been on his entire life. And and part of it is you know it's just evil, satanic, diabolical. But it might just be explained in psychological terms. That's right. We're going to break in one minute. Coming back with call after call. Mark, Chris, Howard, Andrew, Jim, we're going right to the break. What do you make of the WikiLeaks and all the clear pedophile code words? I mean, I'm looking at this. It's clearly pe pedophile code words. I mean, what the hell's going on there? 
I thought that what had happened in Belgium and uh, that area like 20, 25 years ago, I thought that was an aberration. But apparently when you get into the upper levels of the, of the, of evil, you know, the evil power, it seems to go towards, um, to go towards this uh, ritualistic pedophilia rings. It's just pretty disgusting. But when you look at some of these characters that are around Hillary, you have to wonder what, uh, you know, what kind of evil is there? I mean, uh, Huma Abedin from age 19, a 19 year old intern has become her uh, body companion. You know, she's the one that's in the bedroom. She's the one that is never away from her side from age 19. And of course, she's a Muslim. Only. We'll be right back with your phone call straight ahead. I'm Alex Jones, InfoWars.com. The website for our guest is a very important website, EnemiesFarnedDomestic.com. Stay with us. It's an incredible time to be alive right now, and history's happening in front of our eyes. I made the film Endgame nine years ago. I showed hundreds of quotes, video clips of global elite admitting they treat us like creatures in a Petri dish. They're manipulating us. They're playing games with us. And all I'm saying is, I don't like this, and I want to I want to change it. I want to turn this around. I'm going to go to your phone calls right now. I'm not going to belabor this. We're running the biggest specials so far of the year during the Cyber Monday. All the Black Friday specials are extended. 50% off colloidal silver, silver bullet, 30% off super Bowl vitality. There's a whole bunch of specials. 40% off high-quality storable foods. Free shipping with the promo code on top of it. Free, F-R-E-E, InfoWarsStore.com. And that's what makes the broadcast possible. I've noticed that one of the main establishment attacks was, oh, my gosh, they sell stuff. Yeah, we don't have Mercedes Benz as sponsors. We don't have Barnes & Noble as sponsors. We have some sponsors on the network, and we have some sponsors as well. That pays about 30% of it. We direct sale products. And so that's how we fund this operation. So we couldn't do it without you. You see the big effects we're having you see us all over the news being attacked. It's because we're effective, and the enemy knows we're having a big effect. So thank you all for the support. Infowarsstore.com or call toll-free, 888 And as I said, whatever's going on in Central Texas, it's kind of like that movie, The Happening, I think is the name of it, where the trees release the pollen and kill everybody. I used to think when I was in high school that friends of mine that didn't go to two-a-days and said they had allergies were hypochondriacs. I thought it was fake. Um... My allergies have gotten a lot better as I've lost some weight and stuff. But right now, half the office is sick or more. And how this is legendary. I mean, it feels like my lungs have a bucket of fire ants in them right now. So I'm not trying to talk all deep and cool here with you. In fact, I'm using it on my bedside. This is not a plug. Somebody run me in some, uh, got taken away some uh, lung cleanse. I haven't thought of that. That's what helps me at night sleep. A bunch of essential oils. Yeah, they sell stuff for like 20 bucks. It's like menthol and a couple other things. This is dozens of essential oils. The only problem is it's so thick, you got to, every every other time you use it, wash out the sprayer tip. Because it's so thick, uh, it will uh, not spray through it. Thank you. So this is a new package of it. I need to take this home because I've had a package for about six months. I haven't really gone through it yet, but it's almost it's almost empty. This is the ultimate lung cleanse. Uh, thing out there, but I tell you, we are under such assault, all the GMO, the glyphosates, all the rest of it, and I, I wanted to be on early, so I apologize, but, uh, we'll see how that does, because let me tell you, it is fun. Now, getting back to Matt Bracken of EnemiesForeignAndDomestic.com, I want to go to your phone calls right now and, and, and take your questions and comments, but I feel guilty that I'm not able to get excited enough and upset enough, Matt, about Hillary wanting a recount, the Black Lives Matter running around groups calling for cops being killed. They're shooting them almost every day dead. And the media, even CNN's like, well, they're cops. They deserve to die. It's their job. The random killing of people is such an authoritarian thing. Well, I think they're just pulling out all the stops. I, I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to say something about cops. Um, you know, in my youth, I was a Navy SEAL, um, not career, but I you know, went to, when I was a uh, you know, junior officer. I couldn't be a cop for two weeks, I guarantee you. I mean, I'd, I'd absolutely lose my mind. I'd go into some house and see uh, child abuse going on, and and I would flip out. So how you can be a, a social worker, 
and carry a gun at the same time is something that I couldn't juggle personally. I totally agree. Just watching it and covering it drives me crazy. I couldn't do it. So how, how you can expect to uh, make a you know, nanosecond decision, life or death, and they're going to dissect that nanosecond into a billion micro nanoseconds and hang you on it. When day in and day out, you know, you're seeing motor vehicle accidents, and, you know, you're seeing uh, domestic abuse situations and elder abuse and child abuse. And to be, be able to keep a serenity inside and not not go home and, and be a psycho in your own house to your own children. So I, I give all honor and respect to law enforcement that can juggle all of that and balance all of that, because I know within my own heart and my own soul, I wouldn't last two, two weeks as a cop. At any level, I couldn't do it, Matt. That's well I said. Couldn't do, I couldn't. I couldn't carry that job. I couldn't do it. So God bless the police. Without them, you know, there was a famous incident in uh, Montreal, Canada, about 30 years ago. 30, maybe it was in the 70s, where the police went on strike, and immediately the every jewelry store was hit. You know, they, as soon as the, the the criminals figured out this was for real, the police have gone on strike. It was complete mayhem. Immediate. So there are. You know, thousands, even millions of predators out there without any morals or scruples or conscience that if they knew that the police were out of the way, they would absolutely wreak havoc on society. And that, I think, is part of the whole deal with uh, with the this cabal between Soros, the uh, propaganda media and the Democrat Party is to is to uh, break the morale of the police, just get them to either stay in their patrol cars, you know, hide behind Dunkin' Donuts, don't get out there and mix it up, don't do your job, just basically demoralize law enforcement. And I think that's- I agree, uh, that's but that, hasn't it backfired? Hasn't it backfired? I hope so, but it, uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, um, it, re it certainly isn't going to help minority neighborhoods if the police won't go in there, because then you're just handing over control to the gangs completely. So, I mean, yeah, it, obviously there are bad cops and obviously some cops get, go on a power trip and maybe some people come into law enforcement because they've got like a latent power, power uh, you know, uh, urge to be a, a bully sort of thing. But I don't think by far most cops... I think I believe sure by far they, though they want to be the sheep cops they aren't where I agree cops aren't where the revolution happens and the fact that Soros and the mainstream media want to make that the main focal point we can deal with the cops that have problems the issue is is that this is an attempt to destabilize the whole country Mark in California you're on the air with Mr. Bracken go ahead yeah thanks for having Matt on KOMY 1540 I really appreciate that you know um Matt and Alex um when we think about King Cyrus, he's much more than a king because this is he of whom it is written, Behold, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. And when Trump uh, came out and just was honest about Castro, I can't tell you what that did for me. You know, all these lying commies, you know, give, you know talking about how great the man was, He's a despicable communist, and he's going to go to hell after on Judgment Day. And uh, when we think about how Trump has appointed these guys, I mean, think about it. We've gone from Eric Holder, who says we have to, quote, brainwash him to hate guns, and uh, what's her name, Loretta Lynch, for attorney general, that after, you know, uh, San Bernardino happened, uh, she says we'll prosecute you to the full extent of the law if you speak against Muhammad, to Jeff Sessions. And we need to pray for Jeff. And pray that yes. God will fight with outstretched arm, you know, against yes. uh, uh, Chucky Schumer and such. And, uh, you know, because this is really exciting. This is exciting. This is God. It's the well, I agree. God. And the enemy is crapping themselves and is planning something in the next 53 days. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, this on that, is Matt. a civil war. This is a civil war. We are in a civil war. Make no mistake. It's not at the shooting in streets uh, phase of a civil war. But believe me, like he, he put his finger right on it. Holder and Lynch, and then Jeff Sessions, uh, this Jay Johnson, and then and then General Flynn. This is tectonic. This is this is you know it's Richter opposites. scale twelve. It's opposites. It's yeah, it, it is opposites, and they're not going to just quit. Let me ask you this, because obviously we, none of us could war game this and know how it's going to go. But hypothetically, we're not calling for this. If they suspend things, say Trump lost. Let's say they kill Trump. Say, oh, he's died in a helicopter crash. Hillary's coming in or whoever. 
and announced that we're shutting down, you know, uh, the, the fake press. That's us. They're going to arrest us. We're not looking for trouble, but when folks try to pull up and take us off to the, the re-education center, I guess all bets are off. I just want to make sure, because it won't do anything. The, the, the foolish cops or anybody else, the young military officers, how do we get around them to the real targets? There aren't enough. There aren't, there aren't enough, especially uh, the fleas, the federal law enforcement agents. There just aren't enough. The math doesn't work. You know, all, of the, all of the power of the state could barely get to, to, to Louisiana after Katrina. And no, I agree. So why are they flames, so arrogant? Because they've taken our restraint as weakness when there are like millions of veterans, many of which I know, that aren't looking for trouble. They're not scared to die. They are ready to just dominate. And I don't not, think not only that, I, I would I would ref uh, I would recommend people read um, some of my essays, like the uh, Civil War Two Cube, um, which is uh, sort of like a Rubik's cube showing the uh, uh, demographic, cultural, and geographical axes that that the Civil War will be fought on. Or my other essay on um, when the music stops, how America's cities may explode in violence. Um, if you look at the red-blue county map, most of the food grows in the red counties. Most of the energy comes out of the ground in the red counties. I was about to say, we have 90% geographically. In military nomenclature, isn't that total dominance? Well, and, and the, they say, well, we have more people. We won the popular vote. A lot of people is not an advantage if you can't feed them. A lot of people is a, is a tremendous... No, no, it's true. The communists and the globalists want to play this capitulation game. And I'm not looking for this, but if they want to take the gloves off... Don't they in a bare knuckles fight? We kick their ass. Well, in the, if you look at the Russian Revolution, when the Russians came home from World War One, they were carrying uh, most of the Gant rifles and swords and and uh, pistols, revolvers, um, but they were disarmed very quickly by the communists. They ordered it, and the people turned them in. That's right. And, That's not going to happen this time. But then they could go out in the countryside and they could literally steal the food from farmers, leave nothing in the Ukraine, leave, leave, take the grain from the Ukraine and leave the Ukrainians to starve. That would absolutely not work in the United States of America. The other, the other big factor is our agriculture now is big mass uh, industrial agriculture. It's not a family farm. So if the, if the uh, transportation infrastructure breaks down and there's no oil and fertilizer going out to the farms, then there's no food going anywhere. And the power will be in the small, self-sufficient family farms. That's right. So it'll be a, it'll be a starvation. So I'm not looking for, for trouble, America, but if they want to push the this, if they want to push this into a hot war, they're, they're entering our briar patch. And that the, the, in the last occasions that we could use as references of the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, they were able to harness and uh, militarize the urban population go out into the countryside with guillotines uh, and uh, execution squads in Russia and take the food by force. They would never be able to take the food by force in this country. It would be a suicide mission for a... a, a uh, Every good old player. boy, and I don't care what color they are, isn't looking for trouble. They are locked and loaded and ready to kill. And, for, and forget about the, the uh, AR-15 uh, uh, so-called assault rifles, yeah, that's interesting. They're fun to plink oh, on steel. 50 with. cows everywhere. It's it's no, it's just the basic Remington 730 odd six with the cheap Bushnell scope on top. That's a 500 yard rifle. Yeah, everybody's got millions that. Millions of them. There's millions of Can them. Can you imagine if they try to march a communist army of pot-bellied dumbasses in against us? What'll happen? Well, at the, at the first bridge, it would just be a, a choke point, and after that, it would be uh, impassable because somebody laying in a, in a culvert 500 yards from the bridge will be able to stop anybody. There just aren't enough drones and helicopters to play uh, you know, uh, um, some kind of video game war where they go out and— No, I agree. I hear from the stuff. leftists. Their favorite statement is, we got drones, we'll kill you. Look, we're not looking for a war, dumbasses. But if you physically want to start one, are you, I mean, you really have no idea what you're dealing with. And who do they think the drone operators are? They're military, and they're you know 90 percent on our side. They come from the red counties, so they it would believe me, it would be a starvation event for the entire country. But the cities would absolutely implode into cannibalism. We've killed 55 million babies. Maybe we deserve that. Let's take a call from Chris in Virginia here on the air. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, it seems like to me that you're a pretty bright person. And, and thorough with your research. So I was wondering if you picked a long time ago the battle that you was going to fight to go after the globalists and 
and go that route and expose them as opposed to going after them Satanists, which I believe is the real issue. It's the same people. I believe they it's the same people. It's the Listen, same people. we tried to, we took over the Republican Party with Trump. I mean, we're, we, mean to, we mean to win. Everybody doesn't realize the power of the individual. I'm not here on some power trip, but I mean, you know, I talked to the president. I talked to everybody else, generals, you name it. They all, the people, they care. They're waiting for leadership, too. The fact that we amassed this huge audience has given them the power. And I don't say that to brag, but they, let me tell you something, InfoWars, you, the listeners, you are what gives them the power to do this that's happening now, my friend. And, and, and it's not a question of us choosing the time. Eventually, I mean, we're sort of like racing towards the edge of a, uh, of a plateau where there's a cliff like in Indiana Jones or uh, uh, the flight Exactly. Of the we don't want this event horizon. We've been pushed it's into this. It's coming anyway. It's like what Trotsky said. You may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. And like it or not, eventually, you know, the, the global financial structure, which is a house of cards soaked in gasoline, eventually that's going to implode. The ATMs are not going to work. The EBT system is not going to work. Get, you know, the credit cards aren't going to work. And, and a week after that, our cities will be not will not be and whether you're rich or poor that affects you the same way exactly and i take it i take it matt bracken in the last five years we reported it for anybody else did but it's now admitted the elite going to armor redoubts all over the world hiring huge security teams who are my listeners who are ready to turn on them in an instant that seems to be their achilles heel they're already evacuating that shows they've already lost right a plan to ride a tiger is not the same as riding a tiger so you know when when this house of cards burns down it's going to burn well, Matt, a lot do they have any idea how much the Blackwater and all the other folks that on average are good people that are guarding them, how much they hate them? I don't. I talked to not. these folks. I don't think they have any idea that they think they've got a 50-man team guarding them in New Zealand. They have no idea. Those guys are just waiting. I, I know somebody that works in your neck of the woods up in, um, up in Amarillo, Pantex, and he's a He's a you know ex special operations guy who now makes high dollar for unscrewing nukes and putting them back together, and he tells the uh, security guards inside of the locked facility, "Thanks for carrying my gun until I need it," and that's how the Blackwater guys look at their so-called employers. Thanks for letting me drive your armored Mercedes until I need it, <laughs> because you'll be on the curb at best. I know that's they're so stupid. They're, they're sitting there in armored redoubts with fifty killers. Right. And these guys have no them. respect for them because they're traitors. Do they have any idea they're just sharpening their knives, just waiting. And, uh, and imagine if imagine if the traitors that they're guarding are, you know, abusing children around the swimming pool while the Blackwater guys are watching. They're not happy about it, believe me. The Blackwater guys have a plan to bring their own families to the redoubt after they, uh, you know, get rid of their uh, so-called bosses. <laughs> I know. They should know that. They are so freaking stupid, aren't they? They are. Absolutely. Skip this break. Let's go to more calls. Uh, who, did I just talk to Chris or did I just talk to John? All right. Howard in Arkansas. You're on the air. Yes. Hello, Alex. Hello, Matt. Thanks. Hi. Uh, yeah, your phone's breaking up, Howard. Go ahead. Yeah, we're going to move on. You're having phone trouble. Andrew in Minnesota. You're on the air. Andrew, go ahead. Hi, Alex. Uh, I had just a, qu a couple of quick points, if I could. Uh, one is, that I think you would agree that uh, language is, can be very powerful. And you know, uh, when you talk about illegal aliens uh, voting in our elections and everything, it just seems to roll off people's backs. But you know, there are also Mexican citizens, so I think it would garner more outrage if we were saying Mexican citizens are voting in our elections and Mexican citizens are are draining our our uh, government resources and things like that, it, it uh, changed the perspective I think a lot of people have. Oh, I agree. And it's not that we're against the Mexicans. It's that they wouldn't let us engage in that. And this is a joke that is going on. Democrats everywhere are passing laws that let illegals vote. Then they say Trump is a conspiracy terrorist to say 3 million illegals were on the voting rolls. They were. Right. They give them the, the, boat, the, voter, uh, I, the voter card with their you know, their driver's license. Uh, I, I also think that it's very immoral for us to let um, Carlos Slim and these Mexican billionaires to let them just push the poor and the, the poorest people out of their country to go to America to send checks back. 
I say send those people back to Mexico now that they've had a taste of freedom and opportunity. Send them back to Mexico with a you know with a, an instruction for a revolution for a uh, a true free market in Mexico and not this you know crony oligarch kind of of a of a system that they have perpetuated. And I'd, I'd also want to see Trump start building this wall very fast because that will be a, a visual galvanizing experience. After 30 years of hearing to politicians talk about protecting that fence, that wall, or excuse me, even building any kind of a barrier, virtual fences, drones that never take off. When we actually see a fence being built from the Gulf of Mexico to San Diego, it's gonna be galvanizing. It's gonna mean this is for real. You know, I think that's when we will see self-deportation a lot of self-deportation. Yeah, exactly. I, I All we care about is the criminals self-deporting. It's just it's just that they're meant to be brought here. The Democratic Party operatives. Thank you, Andrew. And I, I and I bear them no ill will. And I wish that they go back to Guatemala, El Salvador, and Mexico, and force their leaders to be responsible to the entire country, and not just use America as their safety blow-off valve. Jim, Jim in Georgia, you're on the air. Hello, Alex. This is Jim down in Georgia. Say, I spent my time in the military. I did six years in the infantry, got out back in 83. In 1988, I started getting involved in a local militia up in Wisconsin, where I was from originally. In 1994, 95, actually spring of 95, a manual came into the possession of our company commander, who had some, he was a Vietnam vet with some black ops in Northern Africa, and I believe it was one of his friends from the inside that might have gotten it to him. But it was called, it's called an FM-4110, a Military Civil Affairs Operations Manual. It says on the cover, it doesn't say classified or top secret or top secret, but it does say on the cover, destruction notice, destroyed by any method that will prevent disclosure or reproduction of this document. Well, they failed in their mission because this man ran a couple hundred copies, and I got the first one off the press. But that was about the only one that got released. It may have been two or three others because it wasn't long after that. His log cabin burnt down in the middle of the night. Luckily, the dog woke up. His okay, son, well, his son. I happen to pretty much know everything about that kind of stuff. So tell me what it supposedly says. You know the 4110. All right, we disclosed it to the Milwaukee Sentinel Journal in 1995. Sure, so what did it say? All right, in this manual, the the military made a statement to the paper that this meant, yes, there is such manual. It was developed only for use in foreign countries during times of war. Well, it talks in here about guest troops coming to host nations to quell civil disturbances and other major problems, and it's implemented after martial law. I find it funny that they'd say it was for foreign countries because in my copy it has a map of the continental United States broken into. Sure, let me bring this up. I don't know about the particular thing you're mentioning, but... I've read the Washington Post, Toronto Star on Air from about 12, 14 years ago, where they said, we'll use Mexican and Canadian troops to quell terrorism and civil disobedience in America. That's actually in my film, Police State 2, The Takeover. So I know I've read those plans, very, very bold plans. Let's get Matt Bracken's take on that. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that um, with that manual. I've seen, other, I've seen other manuals talking about civil affairs, which... You know, clearly show plans uh, for uh, setting up, uh, you know, detention camps and things like that are pretty scary. The, but like I always that's say, that's the civilian ride, inmate labor camp program. That's that's yeah. embedded, yeah. But a, a plan to ride a tiger is not the same as riding a tiger. Anybody who you know, talk is cheap and man manuals are cheap. But they got to remember that the people that they're depending on, it's just it's just like the Blackwater guards for these elites in their in their uh, re, that they're in their redoubts and retreats. The people that they think are going to be rounding us up are us. It's not going to work. What I could much more likely see. By is the way, let me ask you this, particular, and then continue. Would you say ninety percent of actual trained troops, special forces people, operators are patriots, just because that, that's the type of folks they are? Well, it, 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 you have to distinguish between combat arms and uh, some logistics and support. A lot of the bases that I've been on, it, it almost seems like a welfare program has been instituted in the last Sure, but I mean, years. all the real people that actually put themselves in line the for war death, fighters. The, the, the war, war fighters, fighters seem to all be dialed into freedom. Yes, they are, and they're, they're very much so. And, I've, and it's very rare to meet a war fighter who is a liberal, although I will say that um, both Petraeus and McChrystal 
are on record as being against uh, civilians owning semi-automatic rifles, which worries me a lot. Um, but they're just, you know, the higher up that they go, it seems like they, they uh, you know, they, they, they select for sycophancy and for, you know, go along to get they along. They smoke the dope. Right. They want to they become a member sure, of so the Sure. So what elite. number? What, 95% though, warfighters are patriots? Of, of combat arms of, of uh, 04, you know, major and lieutenant commander and below, I would say yeah, 90% are, are uh, patriots in that way. And, and they definitely believe in the Constitution and defending it against all enemies, foreign and And they're not domestic. afraid to kill people. That's what folks you understand. And if they're told that if they're told they're to take these uh, ten buses from the base to go to some subdivision and round everybody up, the people who give that orders are much more likely to be hanged from the flagpole than those buses go out. And, 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 and let's say the first fight. roundup, maybe they don't hang, but once they see families mowed down, then then it's over. It's over, and and the people that would that would be going along with any orders, and I'm and I'm not I'm I'm going to be nonpartisan in this case. If it was, no matter who said we're going to go round up the Jews, the Muslims, the blacks, I don't care. It wouldn't go down. It, it just it wouldn't be successful. It would. The people giving those orders would be hung. They should know that. That's why I say it. They should All know right. that. All right. Well, powerful interview, Matt Bracken, enemiesforeigndomestic.com. I'm going to come back and uh, hand the baton to David Knight. Thank you for so much, so much insight. We really appreciate you, brother. Thanks for having me on, Alex. You've had a very important interview. Stay with us. Fourth hour straight ahead. I love how all these trendies, all these delusionals, thought they'd just take over America and set up their world government, piss all over the republic without a fight. As they get deeper into this thing, they realize it's far from what they thought it'd be. Now they're fighting for their lives. That makes the enemy even more dangerous now. They're not just operating on hubris. As I've said many times, wild horses... Couldn't drag me away from what I'm doing here today. I'm not trying to talk like some guy from a wolf playing chili ad. My, my lungs are pretty infected today. But as I said, wild horses couldn't drag me away. I just look at the offense of a culture that makes women wear hoods over their heads and cuts their genitals off and then floods our country with it. Paul Watson, InfoWars.com. Canada celebrates a jib-wearing news anchor while Christians on the same network are banned from wearing crosses. And then you hear about a machete attack, but the news is saying it's a gun attack. That's how controlled the press is. So I got upset about that. And then sure enough, it was a jihadi from Somalia. In my own life, I don't need to blame some group or hate some group to feel good about myself. The fact that Muslims are on average so oppressed and so backwards makes me feel sorry for them. But I, I can't be told that I'm some backwards guy that hates women when all I do is spoil women. I can't sit here and listen to lies anymore. I can't go along with this BS anymore. I can't. I've had dinners with these pseudo-intellectual big newspaper reporters, liberal icons. They're like mental midgets. It's like, how the hell are you ruling over us? But it's because the power structure put them in power. Because they're bent dick bastards. They're not straight shooters. Man. These people put me anywhere in a fight. Half of them don't know who their daddy is. I don't mean that mean to folks don't know who their daddy is, but knowing who your daddy is is a lot bigger than knowing who your daddy is. They don't stand for anything except screwing people over. They're the most unhappy, miserable people I could ever imagine. And I think in this great animating contest of liberty, the most important thing I could ever transmit to anybody is that we not be part of these people. God, they're a joke. I want to play this clip, though, of the jihad training, because... We're bringing people in from third world countries that oppress their own people. And they're being brought here as cultural detonators. Imagine a woman can't wear a cross on CNN, but this woman can wear, wear that all arrogantly 
and her little Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. I'm not going to go along with her. Here's a clip. Not the time come to defend the Muslims. Has not the time come to avenge the bereaved woman. Has not the time come to seek revenge for the imprisoned. So where jihad? Fight for your religion, your soul, your honor, before you shout in regret, if only I acted when I had the opportunity. I'd like to spit some beach nut in that dude's eye and shoot him with my old 45. I love how he was using the anti-Nazi refrain. God, what a piece of work. What a cult of scum. All right, David Knight's coming up. I want to thank you all for your support, your prayers. InfoWars is the tip of the spear. God, I never asked for this. I guess I did ask for it, but never knew it would happen. Appreciate the great crew and all the work they're doing. I'll be back tomorrow, Lord willing, 11 a.m. Central. David Knight is coming up from the studio about 30 feet from me. He'll be locked and loaded and ready to stay with us and spread the word because they hate this broadcast. Welcome back to the fourth hour of the Alex Jones Show on this Monday, November 28th, 2016. Cyber Monday. If you're paying any attention to the sales and the specials that have started uh, on Thanksgiving this year, uh, a lot of optimism we see in these sales figures as people are looking forward to a, a change of events, a new deal, a, an environment that is going to put the economy first. And, of course, I think that was the key thing. I think uh, Donald Trump... Didn't stress it as much as he could have, but people understood that what this was about was the economy. And I think that was really a major part of the win for Donald Trump to understand that he was going to do things, as we saw with the Thanksgiving weekend, to tackle carrier air conditioning and say, uh, d don't move your factory to uh, Mexico. Let me tell you why. We don't know what he said to them. Maybe he said, uh, you know, you're going to find that it isn't really going to work out for you if you do that. Because it's not going to give you a price advantage. We're going to make sure that doesn't happen. I don't know what he did, but uh, hopefully that is in play. And we see that type of thing. And at the same time, as I tweeted out, it says amazing contrast between Obama and Hillary Clinton, who bragged about how they were going to take jobs, how were they going to shut down entire industries, how they were going to starve us of energy, how they were going to shut off our air conditioning even. We just had John Kerry, middle of September, saying, yeah, we're going to... We're going to cap your air conditioning usage, and then we're going to start reducing it right away. Uh, no, you're not. From my cold, dead hands. <laughs> and so now there's optimism. You know, we've got, uh, it looks like we're going to have somebody who is friendly to our economic activities, who wants us to have air conditioning and things like that. Uh, so uh, I think there's a lot of optimism that we're seeing in these figures. And, of course, we have a lot of sales at InfoWars as well. Uh, from Black Friday to Cyber Monday, we've got several spell, uh, sales at uh, InfoWarsLife.com. Some of those 50% off a of silver bullet at InfoWarsLife.com. 30% off Super Male Vitality at InfoWarsLife.com. Also, we have uh, Black Friday specials that we've extended uh, through today. 30 to 40% off all InfoWars Select Storable Food and 30% off Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine. All of those are key ingredients for your uh, preparedness as well as for your health. And this is a great time to stock up on it. Uh, you should be optimistic, but also be prepared. Now, today, I want to talk about several things that have been bothering me over the last couple of days as we look at uh, the transition. We've got Barack Obama saying that uh, he's going to put in a flurry of new rules for us. Uh, forget the fact that uh, hopefully Donald Trump is going to reduce these. I remember during the campaign, it was just back the beginning of October, that uh, Donald Trump was talking about how he's going to reduce uh, probably 70% of the regulations, he said. And the Hill took him to task, and they said, no, you can't do that. You can't just cut regulations that easily. Going back to October 7th, they said uh, the issue of regulation has been so thoroughly politicized that it's not surprising if members of the public think that issuing a regulation or rescinding one is something that a president can do with the stroke of a pen. Now, I think you need a phone, too, don't you, Obama? You need a pen and a phone to do that kind of stuff. They say regulations often get confused with executive orders, which can actually be done away with quite easily. Oh, really? Okay, well, let's, let's talk about the regulations. And I think this is a key thing to understanding... How much power has been concentrated in the office of president and why it is such a bad thing? And hopefully this is going to change under 
Trump. If not, hopefully at least he will remove some of the burdensome regulations that have been placed on us. He'll take those away. And whether they've been done by executive order or whether they've been done by the orders of the massive bureaucracy. Remember the Declaration of Independence where uh, they said uh, that the king had uh, swarms of officers that were harassing our people and eating out their substance? Remember when we rebelled against taxation without representation? Well, we have all that in these bureaucracies. We not only have taxation without representation, we not only have swarms of officers who harass us, who eat out our substance, but we also have uh, regulation without any representation. We have legislation without representation, not just taxation. Understand that these regulatory agencies are little empires under themselves. They have, they write their own laws, they're given broad powers by the Congress, which has abdicated its power to these regulatory agencies, and they work under and with the president as an extension of executive orders. You need to start thinking of the EPA and the IRS and all these other regulatory agencies. You need to start thinking of them as an extension of executive orders because that's truly what they are. And so we should get to the bottom of this. It's one of the reasons why, as I look at all these different cabinet picks that Trump is doing, in many regards, I just look at it as like, I just wish he would shut down that entire organization as opposed to putting somebody in front and at top of it and continuing on with it. But they talk about, and they said this uh, back in October 7th, this uh, editorial by The Hill said Trump can't really cut these regulations because it takes a very long time to do it. It's a very time-consuming process, they said. Proponents of regulation often complain about just how hard it is to get a new regulation. Oh, yeah. That's why we have 80,000 plus pages of them every year because it's so, so difficult. <laughs> no, no, it's not hard. But they do drag the process out. They say, for better or worse, it takes roughly the same amount of time to get rid of one. Years, they say. First, the agency has to propose a regulation. Then they open the proposal for public comment. Then if it has a large economic impact... Then we have to do studies about that. Then once they get all this stuff back, they have to respond to the comments, redo their analysis and so forth. And then they're going to get sued. So they, they say one of the key things, and this is what you have to understand, the purpose of regulations, the purpose of the FDA, the purpose of all these other regulatory agencies is, is if, if an industry has spent millions of dollars coming into compliance with the regulation, they're not likely to be happy that new competitors can now enter the market without complying with those regulations. You understand? Then when we look at stuff like the Dodd-Frank bill, that was not really set up to control the banks. If they wanted to control the banks, they'd break them up, which is what Bill Clinton did. He created the too big to fail bank mergers, the first one being Nation Bank and Bank of America. And then they all started merging. Everybody said, we're going to wind up with five or six banks that are huge. And that's what we did. And they were too big to fail, too big to jail. We've seen that type of thing over and over again. When you look at the FDA, what do they do? They put these regulations in here so that they can keep other people from getting into competition with them. That's the whole purpose of this. That's why you have regulatory capture. They speak of that. They take control of the FDA and their regulators to keep their competitors at bay. Look at what happens to somebody who wants to start a new car company, for example. You have this guy, the only person I've seen that has seriously tried to start a new car company, I think since uh, DeLorean, is this guy Elio. And what did he have to do? He had to go to something that had three wheels so he could escape some of the onerous regulations that were put in there by Detroit to keep competition out. They don't want new competition. So he had to create a car that wasn't technically a car. And we'll see how that goes. But that's the purpose of these regulations. And so when I look at this, I look at this article that came out of the uh, Christian Science Monitor. It was linked on the Drudge Report. Federal agencies are pushing a flurry of midnight rulemaking under Obama. They talk about how, well, the White House is reviewing as many as 98 final regulations that could be implemented before Trump takes office, including 17 with an estimated annual economic impact of $100 million or more. That would be each, folks. Each of those 17 uh, regulations would have an impact of more than $100 million. See, that's the issue. And that's what needs to stop. We need to have something that is going to... We need to have a revolution. It needs to be based on the Constitution. And the thing that I'm concerned about with the Trump transition team, as we've seen now, there's been so much pushback against Romney... Uh, Kellyanne Conway is talking about how uh, the masses of people are furious about this. Others have spoken out against it, like Huckabee, like Gingrich, that it's a betrayal if he, if he were to do this. I think it's a big mistake. I think we need somebody 
who is going to not push back against Donald Trump's agenda, what he ran on. And I don't really understand. I understand reaching out to the other side, trying to get a consensus. But when you pick somebody like your chief of staff, like Priebus, or you pick somebody like Romney, or even worse, Petraeus, as they're now talking about, when you do that, you have to understand that what he's doing when he puts these people in as chief of staff, as secretary of state, he's really kind of running a three-legged race with these people. And that's kind of hard to do when the other guy is desperately trying to go in the other direction. When these guys are dyed in the wool globalists who are going to fight you on these key issues, that's a real problem. And uh, when we look at this, I want to look at this in uh, just a moment. Some of the other things I'm going to talk about in this hour, just to give you an idea. And if I don't get to all of these things, I'll be talking about them on the nightly news tonight where I'm hosting. Uh, I'll also be talking about the world leaders' reactions to Fidel Castro. There's uh, an amazing uh, Twitter hashtag that is really hilarious that came out of uh, response to Pierre Trudeau's eulogy for Fidel Castro, uh, people making fun of that. But I also want to give you just my personal take on it. Somebody who grew up in Florida, who was a child during the Cuban Missile Crisis, who knew a lot of liberty-loving Cubans. Also, I want to talk about Jill Stein and this attack, not only on Trump, but on the Electoral College and why the Electoral College is so important. And uh, I want to get to all that, but let's go back to Petraeus here for a moment. Understand where Petraeus is coming from as we see the, the, the news articles that today he is going to be going to Trump Tower to talk to Donald Trump about Secretary of State. Also, Mitt Romney is going to be coming back again tomorrow. Hopefully, that's going to be a meeting where Donald Trump says, sorry, it looks out like the engagement is off. Can I have the ring back? Okay, I hope that's what's going to be behind this Romney meeting. But it concerned me very much to see David Petraeus there. Why? Why? Because David Petraeus has been a strong supporter and ally of Hillary Clinton. He was during the election. He is a, not only a frequent, but a regular attendee of Bilderberg. He's one of the inner circle of Bilderberg. That's where he hangs out. Okay, he's an emerging leader amongst the globalists. Okay, this guy is, Petraeus, is a nascent Kissinger or nascent Brzezinski. We do not want to have them take over the Trump presidency by having somebody like this in that position. He's also a Wall Street crony capitalist. He also is a gun control advocate. He's also a supporter of total surveillance state. Remember when he was bragging about how your appliances, the Internet of Things, all these things are going to be spying on you very soon? And he was happy about that. Stay with us. We're going to be right back. We're going to talk about what's behind all of this. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, your host. I was just talking about the possibility that... Donald Trump might choose General Petraeus as a Secretary of State and not Mitt Romney. Would that be better? I think it might be even worse than Mitt Romney, and I'm not at all a supporter of Mitt Romney for that position. Let me tell you. Think about what the duties of the Secretary of State are. Okay, Secretary of State is going to be essentially the, the president's eyes and ears abroad. It's going to be involved in war and peace and determining whether or not we're going to uh, go to war with people or we're going to have peace or we're going to have more interventionist wars. He's also going to be involved with the trade treaties. He's going to be involved with the climate treaties, as we've seen with John Kerry. Is this going to be somebody that is going to be on Donald Trump's side, that is going to further the policies that Donald Trump ran on and got elected on, the policies that people voted for him to put in place? Think about General Petraeus. Think about the fact that he is part of the inner circle at Bilderberg. Now, there are people who go to Bilderberg, and they'll go just once, and they'll look at it. It's like, I'm, I'm not going back there. Again, that was Margaret Thatcher. She went, she criticized them, and within a few months, they removed her as prime minister from the U.K. But someone like Petraeus, who has now embedded himself in uh, Wall Street crony capitalism, he's with uh, KKR, he is, I think, an emerging Kissinger, an emerging Brzezinski. This guy is thoroughly a globalist. He is not going to be with Donald Trump in terms of fighting these global trade treaties. I can tell you that. He's probably not going to be with him on the climate treaties as well. He is somebody who has continually supported these kind of interventionist wars. So it's not going to be a pullback against our involvement in unnecessary wars either to have somebody like this. And so I hope that Donald Trump realizes that he doesn't really need the Republicans, and he certainly doesn't need Democrats like Petraeus. Yeah, Petraeus really is a Democrat. Look back 
at the beginning of September. We had this article from Politico saying Clinton was going to convene a meeting at the time with Petraeus and other national security experts. Uh, she was going to have him in along with former Homeland Security Chief Michael Chertoff. These are people who supported her during the election. Understand, Petraeus was a Clinton supporter along with people like Michael Morrill, uh, the former deputy CIA director who was a big league Trump critic, okay? And he openly endorsed Hillary. David Petraeus said a lot of very kind things about Hillary Clinton. And, of course, in this meeting, we also had Janet Napolitano, John Allen, who was also involved in the sex scandal uh, with General Petraeus. What happened with General Petraeus in terms of the emails? It was also the uh, next month in October 22nd. We saw a report from Fox News. We want to talk about this email scandal here that Petraeus essentially had a, a leak of classified information, just like Hillary Clinton did. There were 1,000, and this is key, 1,000 Clinton Petraeus emails that were missing from the records sent to state and the FBI records uh, show. So the issue is this. We've got General Petraeus, who was convicted, and uh, we've got an article here as to uh, who, who was worse in terms of security issues. Clinton or Petraeus? Hillary Clinton or Petraeus? Well, uh, there's two ways to look at this. But the bottom line is, why would we be embracing somebody who has shown open contempt for national security? We have lost virtually all of our freedoms in the last 15 years in the name of national security. It has become a religion of the state. And yet we give the people at the top, Petraeus and Clinton, we give them a pass. And although he was convicted and, uh, of a misdemeanor, even though he had multiple felonies, we let these people get a pass and then we give them rewards of letting them run for president or making them secretary of state? I just don't get it. Here he has a thousand Clinton Petraeus emails. So you might say, well, you know, what, what is this? Why is he meeting and, and the headliner for a security meeting for Hillary Clinton trying to get up her credentials to show that she's really tough on ISIS? Well, it's because they have a deep, long relationship. Say roughly 1,000 emails between Hillary Clinton and General Petraeus were thought to be missing from the 30,000 emails provided by Clinton's team to the State Department in December 2014, according to, back in October 22nd, newly released FBI investigative files. Additional documents obtained through a federal lawsuit by Judicial Watch show that Clinton had directed Petraeus to send her emails at her personal address. So she told David Petraeus... Send these classified documents to me at my personal address. And he did. He's no better than Hillary Clinton. And, of course, they go on to say that um, this was heavily redacted FBI interview summary from August the 17th, 2015. A State Department employee from the Office of Information Programs and Services, which handles FOIA requests, showed how these records are apparently not among those that were turned over by Hillary Clinton. They say they had CENTCOM records that showed approximately 1,000 records, but hey, we can't find those in the ones that were turned over to the FBI. See, they're missing, okay? Understand that. So they hid those emails. What were they hiding? Stay with us, we'll be right back. We're on the march. The Empire's on the run. Alex Jones and the GCN Radio Network. But there was an article last Friday in Hollywood Reporter that is so important where Steve Bannon, the chief strategist for President-elect Trump, lays it out that globalism was designed to make us poor and set up this elite system for rich families to control everything. And that America is going to absolutely now lead the world out of this with incredible prosperity. And they have the actuaries and the numbers with cutting taxes on working class people that will bring back Americana under the Republican Party. But he said... Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, your host this fourth hour. I want to get back to David Petraeus and his involvement in the Hillary Clinton email scandals. A thousand emails. We now uh, found out, actually, it wasn't just now. We found this out uh, back in October uh, that there were a thousand emails between Hillary Clinton and David Petraeus that had gone missing, that the Clinton group did not turn over. So that's obstruction of justice. Uh, that's a very serious felony. What were they hiding there? And what does it tell us when we see that Donald Trump is considering David Petraeus for Secretary of State? And I say this not to criticize, but to warn Donald Trump not to bring somebody like this into his inner circle. We have to understand, 
So the way the system is going to fight this, and they've been fighting it, both the leadership of the Democrats and Republicans, who's pointed out through the entire election, attacking Donald Trump. He won without them. He doesn't need them to govern. He needs the people. He can go over their heads. He can have the same kind of massive uh, rallies that he did when he was running for president. He can communicate directly to the people with social media. He can put pressure on these people using the public. And so it ought to be Donald Trump with the people. Ronald Reagan said he was going to do that. He never did it. Ronald Reagan said he was going to go over the heads of Washington bureaucrats and he was going to go straight to the people. Donald Trump actually did that. And he has done that far to a far greater extent than Ronald Reagan ever did. And we need to understand that when Ronald Reagan became president, one of the ways that they co-opted him was by infiltrating the State Department with 300-plus Council on Foreign Relations people who were globalists, who were warmongers, who were the kinds of people that David Petraeus is. And so when we see CNN reporting that uh, David Petraeus is meeting with uh, Donald Trump at Trump Tower today, and a top transition official tells CNN that many in Trump's camp support having Petraeus fill the position. They say Trump is inclined to pick Petraeus, according to the official, yet he's weighing whether it's a good idea to have two retired generals heading the State Department and the Pentagon. Well, that's not the problem. I mean, he could fill the entire cabinet with generals. That wouldn't be a problem. The problem is filling your inner circle with the kinds of people who opposed you, who opposed the agenda that people voted for. And also the hypocrisy of putting somebody in who has the same kinds of issues as Hillary Clinton. This, and, and, and when we say this, there's been a massive pushback against Mitt Romney. Uh, for whatever reason, Donald Trump thought that Mitt Romney might be a good Secretary of State. Maybe it was being pushed by uh, Reince Priebus. I believe that was probably the case. But the people spoke in massive numbers. Kellyanne Conway is talking about that. And I hope that it isn't simply that they're not opposing him simply because uh, this is uh, partisan tribalism. I hope it's because I understand the principles involved. And I hope they won't bring in David Petraeus, who is equally comfortable with both the Republicans and the Democrats. This guy has absolutely no principles other than globalism. And we have seen that over and over again from him. But when we look at this, going back uh, to, again, to October, this is something from PolitiFact, and at the time, Donald Trump had said, well, David Petraeus was treated worse than Hillary Clinton. She's, he, he was hammered by this, and they said, well, really, whose case was worse? PolitiFact believed that uh, Petraeus' case was worse than Hillary Clinton's. I don't think so, but here's what they said. They said, Petraeus pled guilty in 2015 to a misdemeanor charge of mishandling confidential materials. A misdemeanor charge. Think Now, I want you to hear what he did, okay? Is this a misdemeanor charge of a national security violation? He gave his mistress, Paula Broadwell, access to eight notebooks with top secret and code information. She made copies of over 300 documents that were marked secret. Now, what was he given for that? Well, he was given a $100,000 fine, which is nothing to somebody uh, like him, uh, the kind of connections he has on Wall Street. And he was given two years probation. Now, that was uh, back in 2015. Would he even be eligible to become Secretary of State? Would Donald Trump have to give David Petraeus a pardon in order to make him his Secretary of State? What does that say when you have to give somebody a criminal a pardon so that you can make them Secretary of State? And they say, in addition, David Petraeus lied to FBI agents who were investigating the case. Well, and when he gives up 300 documents that were marked secret, why is that a misdemeanor? Why did that one individual who was a lowly seaman on a submarine who took uh, four or five pictures on a submarine with his iPhone as a souvenir. And those were classified as confidential. Why is he in prison for an extended period of time? And then these people go free. So in Clinton's case, they say, the FBI found 110 emails with classified information on her server, eight of which were designated top secret. Here's the deal, okay? It doesn't matter if you've got 110 classified secret documents or you've got 300 classified documents. You shouldn't be given, have that taken down to a misdemeanor as it was for David Petraeus, or you shouldn't have it completely ignored as it was for Hillary Clinton. Why don't you just make Hillary Clinton your Secretary of State if you're going to go with David Petraeus? We really need to push back on this. We need to do it for the sake of the Republic. We need to do it for the sake of Donald Trump because this guy will torpedo 
his administration. I am absolutely convinced of it. I don't trust David Petraeus whatsoever. Now, let's take a look at the Fidel Castro uh, responses. When I saw the way people were reacting, I tweeted out, uh, and if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm Libertarian, at Libertarian on Twitter. I said, isn't it telling to see Democrats who called Trump Hitler falling all over themselves to praise Castro? And I said, Trump was right. He is a brutal dictator. And here's some of the reactions that we have from USA Today. We've got um, uh, President Obama saying, today we offer condolences to Fidel Castro's family, and our thoughts and prayers are with the Cuban people. Think about if this were Hitler. Would we say, today we offer condolences to Hitler's family, and our thoughts and prayers are with the German people? <laughs> See, there was, a, there was a hashtag that came out because uh, Pierre Trudeau did that. I'm going to read you some of those in a moment. They're really funny. But then, again, the analogy. They, it, he said, this is what Obama said about Castro. He said, for nearly six decades, the relationship between the U.S. and Cuba was marked by discord and by profound political disagreements. Well, what would we have said uh, for nearly a decade, the relationship between the U.S. and Germany under Adolf Hitler was marked by discord and profound political disagreements. Let's call a real dictator a real dictator. That's what these people are unable to do. Uh, Donald Trump, however, was able to do it. And I don't see any other world leader that called it like it was. We did have some commentators who spoke out. We had Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, both of whom had families who came from Cuba who spoke out about that. But Donald Trump said this, and he got it right. He said, today the world marks the passing of a brutal dictator who oppressed his own people for nearly six decades. Fidel Castro's legacy is one of firing squads, one of theft, one of unimaginable suffering, poverty, and the denial of fundamental human rights. While Cuba remains a totalitarian island, Trump said, it is my hope that today marks a move away from the horrors endured for too long toward a future in which the wonderful Cuban people finally live and the freedom they so richly deserve. Yet then we see John Kerry coming out. We extend our condolences to the Cuban people today as they mourn the passing of Fidel. He played an outsized role in their lives, and he influenced the direction of regional and even global affairs, just like Adolf Hitler. <laughs> and then we have Vladimir Putin coming out saying that Castro was a symbol of a whole era of modern world history. Yes, he was. The Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis, and that's my personal connection to Fidel Castro. That and the fact that I grew up with so close to uh, the missiles that they were trying to put in. He brought us, as uh, Peter Hitchens points out in the Daily Mail, Fidel Castro and his pal, uh, uh, what's his name, hammered his, uh, his shoe on the, um, on the dais saying, we will bury you. Uh, the two of them brought us to the brink of Armageddon. And I was a very young child at the time, and I will never, never forget that. And at the time, they told us, even though we had schools that were very close to our homes, we had neighborhood schools in those days, we didn't bus everybody from one side of town to the other. They told us that we wouldn't have time to get home if there was a nuclear attack, because Cuba was so close. And they scared us to death. And with good reason. We were right at the brink. That was the closest the world has ever come to a nuclear catastrophe. And so from that reason alone, we should be upset about it. But we should be upset for what he did to the Cuban people. And I knew a lot of Cubans who had come to Florida from Castro's Cuba. And I have to say that like the people who have escaped communism or other forms of totalitarianism, they are some of the most hardcore liberty lovers you'll ever find. I was friends with a lot of them uh, whose parents had come. Uh, I was in bands with a lot of Cuban guys, uh, Lopez, Diaz, uh, Rodriguez, uh, uh, a lot of guys, really fine musicians, and their parents knew what Cuba was like. They'd had businesses confiscated by this guy, stolen from them. That's the theft that Donald Trump was talking about. They knew people who had been killed by this ruthless dictator. And to see this guy eulogized by these people on the left, even to see him eulogized by the people who are now saying, oh, we don't like the Electoral College, it just isn't democratic enough. And it's like, seriously? Are you serious? 
about this? Look at some of these other reactions. Here's, here's Ireland's president. Having survived some 600 attempts on his life, oh, why would they have tried to kill him? Well, only because he brought us to the brink of an Armageddon. And, and when I go back to Putin's reaction to this, talking about how he was a f friend of Russia and everything, what we need to understand is just how dangerous and provocative it is to position missiles on the border of a country. And we should understand that in our foreign policy as well, because now we are making the same mistake in aggressing against the Russian people in the Ukraine that they did under Khrushchev. That's the name I couldn't remember. <laughs> under Khrushchev, when they came to uh, trying to uh, preposition nuclear rockets in Cuba, as close as it was to Florida. So that was a very provocative thing. Now we are doing the same sort of thing, want to do that in the Ukraine and elsewhere to Russia. It's a very destabilizing thing. So we don't want Secretary of States who do that type of thing. We shouldn't lionize people who do that. Putin shouldn't lionize people uh, that did that to us and at the same time be concerned about us doing that to him in the Ukraine. But let's talk about what Ireland's president said. Oh, he survived 600 attempts on his life after he tried to blow up the world. And he was known to his peers in Cuba as El Comandante. And he became one of the longest serving heads of state in the world. Well, you know what? That's not an accomplishment if you're an authoritarian dictator, because to survive for a long period of time as a head of state, they don't have elections, right? Uh, all these people, again, as I point out, who are, who are complaining about the Electoral College. And as they pointed out in this Reason article where they quoted this, they said, uh, you know what? You don't have uh, peers as an authoritarian dictator. By definition, you don't have peers. And they could say one could argue that the inequality that this guy uh, in, from Ireland says he guided the country through a remarkable process of social and political change, advocating development path that was unique and determinedly independent. Well, you could say that inequality is less pronounced in Cuba than in other Latin American countries because why? The entire country has been taken to the least common denominator, impoverished. That's the way uh, the communists work. Then you've got European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker saying that the world has lost a man who was a hero for many. <laughs> These are the globalists who just love Fidel Castro. He changed the course of the country and his influence reached far beyond. His legacy will be judged by history. Yeah, it sure will. The UK's uh, socialist leader Jeremy Corbyn called him a champion of social justice and as Reason Magazine pointed out, this must be news to the gays who were herded into labor camps following his revolution. The poets and the musicians who were imprisoned for having counter-revolutionary expressions. And the exploited workers who, in the cruelest of ironies, were forbidden from unionizing. Oh, just as they did in East Germany. And then we've got the guy who takes the cake. Justin Trudeau, Canada's prime minister, called... Castro, a remarkable leader, he said he served his people for almost half a century. What does it mean when a dictator is said to have served his people? I'm reminded of the Twilight Zone episode where you have the aliens land and they say, well, you know, we come in peace and we're going to give you all this wonderful technology and, you know, we're, we're your friends. And at the very end, we're here to serve mankind. That's what they kept telling. We're here to serve mankind. At the end, one of the guys gets into the ship and he sees... A cookbook on how to cook human beings and it was called to serve mankind well that's the kind of serving that Fidel Castro did for the Cuban people but that's what Justin Trudeau said he served his people yeah he did he did uh, he was a controversial uh, figure he said but uh, and he had his supporters and his detractors uh, but the Cuban people many had a deep and lasting affection for El Comandante in other words, the commander. And you know, I've seen the same sort of thing when we went to uh, China to adopt my daughter. I saw the cult of personality that had grown up around Mao. Understand the same thing happens in Russia around Stalin. People love strong leaders. And they get very nostalgic for it when they disappear. You know, kind of like we do for Abraham Lincoln, our Stalin in this country. Uh, that's my opinion of Lincoln. But, you know, they love these, these strong leaders. They call them remarkable. And so I want to read you some of the uh, people who trolled Justin Trudeau on Twitter. This is also from Reason. They, uh, they, they pulled out some of these quotes on uh, Trudeau eulogies as the hashtag. Here's one of them. Today we mourn painter and animal rights activist Adolf Hitler. His death's 
also highlights the need for suicide awareness. <laughs> or this one. Mr. Stalin's greatest achievement was his eradication of obesity in the Ukraine through innovative agricultural reforms. Because, of course, he was responsible for mass starvation in the most fertile area of the former Soviet Union. Or President Snow was a troubled leader, but one who knew the value of lasting entertainment for his districts. Uh, let us remember from the Lord of the Rings, Sauron, whose leadership united the disparate peoples across the lands of Middle Earth in a singular purpose. Or this from Star Wars. While controversial, Darth Vader achieved great heights in space construction, <laughs> and he played a formative role in his son's life. Or also from history, I offer my condolences to the family of Genghis Khan, a controversial figure who also created a bond between East and West. Another one from fiction. If nothing else can be said for Hannibal Lecter, at least he had great taste in people. That's the kind of tag you can see at hashtag Trudeau eulogies. Maybe you can come up with some yourself. But of course, Marco Rubio had it right when he said Castro is now facing his maker. After many attempts by the CIA, it was finally old age who got him. And uh, we have Ted Cruz giving an ABC anchor an earful. And if I reaction to Castro's death, he says the funeral will be a test for Obama. Are we going to have Obama and John Kerry or maybe uh, Joe Biden all show up and weep for this dictator? I wouldn't be surprised. That's the kind of leaders they are. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We're going to talk a little bit about the Electoral College. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I am David Knight. I'm going to talk. We've got some breaking news about this uh, challenge to the Electoral College, a challenge to the uh, various states by Jill Stein. And I'm going to talk tonight about what this is truly about. This really is uh, important because it's not just an attack on Donald Trump. It's also an attack on the Electoral College, which is a firewall to the corruption and the concentration of power that we have in big states. You have to understand that's a very important function of the Electoral College. If we didn't have that, then as Donald Trump pointed out, he could have campaigned in four or five big states and that would have been it. And you won't have anybody coming to ask for your votes outside of New York, Chicago and L.A. if we didn't have the Electoral College as it was. He really kind of focused on 15 states out of 50. And if you want to make it even more concentrated and if you want to give the power to rig the election to some of the most corrupt uh, jurisdictions in our country, then by all means, go to a direct popular vote. So we'll talk about that. I've got some breaking news about uh, Jill Stein and her challenge. It looks like she may have lost. I'll tell you why in just a moment. Real quickly, however, I want to remind you of our Cyber Monday and Black Friday specials. Our Black Friday specials have been extended. We had a, um, for 24 hours, we've got a sale of 30% off Survival Shield X2 nascent iodine, as well as 30 to 40% off InfoWars Select Storable Food. So that is something that was part of our Black Friday special, and we've extended it for another 24 hours. Also, we have some specials that are part of our Cyber Monday specials. We have uh, Super Male Vitality, 30% off Cyber Monday special, and we have extended super, uh, Silver Bullet, 50% off at InfoWarsLife.com. So check out the huge savings that we have at InfoWars Life as well as InfoWarsStore.com. Uh, the 30 to 40% off InfoWars Select Storable Food, that is a huge sale, as are the uh, 30 to 50% off of these select ingredients like Survival Shield X2, Silver Bullet, and Super Male Vitality. Now the breaking news that I was just informed of by the crew uh, while we were on break Jill Stein needed to get uh, a recount in, I think it was three states. And if she did that, it would take it down, take them off because she's looking for a hand recount. They would not be able to get that done by the time the Electoral College meets. So those states' votes would not be counted to either candidate, which would mean that the best that Donald Trump would have been able to get was 260 short of the 270. And then that creates more problems in the election, but it would not really change the outcome. It would go then to the House and the Senate, which are controlled by the Republican Party, not likely to have that overturned. However, she has missed the deadline for Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has 20 electoral votes. So that looks like that uh, he would have 280 then uh, with Pennsylvania in the mix, and she would not change anything. I have to say, when I 
looked at all this, the, the point of all this is really to delegitimize the election. This is really the way George Soros starts his color revolutions. Remember, they began immediately with riots in the streets. And part of what he's done in former Soviet Union countries where he's done these color revolutions is, first of all, he does it following an election. He tries to delegitimize the election. And then he tries to paint the person who won the election as authoritarian. That's what's behind all these references to Donald Trump being Hitler, calling him a racist. And then he hopes to use those two things to energize the communist student brigade, which we have plenty of now in the United States after our government has run the education system for decades out of Washington, influenced it. Join us tonight for the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm going to have more on this Electoral College breakdown, as well as many other uh, issues. And that'll be at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern for the InfoWars Nightly News.